We were half a million strong. Half a million. Yeah. <laughs>
didn't know they were vampires. Turns out I was a vampire. I was living in a devil town. Didn't know it was a devil town. Oh, Lord, it really brings me down about the devil town. Wait, where is she at? Is it an email? Uh, messenger. Oh, sorry. Who's this? This is um, Glass Eye. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wish I was able to get more um, familiar with them. Song is about nine minutes. So. Yeah, they're pretty proggy. Yeah. Well, like I said, the fiery furnace is kind of reminding me of them. Oh, there she is. There she is. Hello. Hello. Kathy. Can't hear you yet. I think it's working. Oh wait, it went away. I can't hear you. Hold on. Shoes. Kathy. Kathy. Technology folks. <laughs> Are you unmuted? I think it's working. Oh. I hear you, but you don't. Okay, how about now? Okay, I can't hear you now. Apologize. Here you go. Ever so. This is so disjointed. Yeah, we're so. Well, so disjointed. Kathy, can you hear us? Yes. Yay! Yay. I can hear you, and I think you can hear welcome. me. Well, welcome to our, our what is it, disjointed and... Um, disappointing. And disappointing, uh, let's make oh, a show. Oh, perfect. Yeah. With Brian and Angel. Disjointed uh, and disappointing. Yes. Yeah, we're disjointed and disappointing. Yeah, at least amongst Judy Sill fans, so that's... Okay. Well, that's they're, they're, they're a tough lot, I guess. Are you a fan at all of Judy Who? Sill or no... Judy I don't Sill. know who it is. I don't know who Check it is. Uh, we actually did a whole episode on her last week, uh, which was uh, is with mixed reviews. So you know, but, uh, <laughs> there's a cool documentary coming out. We 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 were able to interview the directors. So yeah, um, yeah. So we were that, we were. That's that's cool. I met a bunch of directors last weekend. Oh, yeah. Which uh, who'd you meet? Well, well uh, they were having a. A soiree, a brunch soiree in uh, honor of Quentin Tarantino, and oh, I got was invited, nice, so I got to meet nice. him. And then there were a whole bunch of other directors there. I mean, I assume who wanted to meet him too, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Did you get to meet him? I, yeah, I did. And he, uh, I think, because everybody else there was, I'm trying to get the lighting good here. I think because everybody else there was uh, in the film industry, um, he ended up talking to me, the lone musician. Uh, more than anybody else, really. <laughs> so that was cool. Oh, there, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Some good lighting. Yeah. yeah. A, fr a friend of mine um, who actually has never seen any of his movies. Uh, that's weird. Met him, <laughs> met him at, yeah, that is, that's another, that's a discussion for another time. Yeah. Um, but, and she was at an Oscars party, uh, you know, an after party. And uh, I guess he found, he was just 
enthralled to be talking to someone who hadn't seen any of his movies. <laughs> well, I, I bet, you know, yeah. uh, I, I bet that's true. Because uh, I, I did feel kind of special because I didn't want anything. You know, <laughs> I was just there like, I, hey, nice to meet you. He was a really nice guy. Uh, yeah. Not at all standoffish or anything like that. Sure. And uh, it was really fun. And uh, I was charming. I'm not always. Uh, I never know if I'm going to be charming or not. You know, it's a right. it's a crapshoot. But I, yeah. I was in a charming mood. And so I charmed him. And that was That's nice. Well, we're and, really excited to have you on the show. Um, yeah, let's. I, hey, well, did you get yeah. the Did you get the record in the mail? It, not time? yet. It didn't oh, come yet, but that stinks. Yeah, but um, I, I was hoping to do like a nice unboxing and everything. Yeah, we can do yeah. it. We'll maybe we'll do an unboxing video when it comes in. Yeah, that's too well, bad. I mean, Brian, Saturday, Saturday morning. It should be there by now. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's. Do you live problem. in an apartment? Yeah, and we have a hub, so it could be that it's held up. It could be in the manager's room. office because the LPs don't fit in the mail slot. I've yeah. Discovered. So a lot of times people are like, I never got my record. And I go, did you check with the manager's office? You know, it's, and then they're like, oh, there it is. You know, <laughs> It's been a rough time for mail records getting mailed to me lately. I, I uh, ordered the new Louis Armstrong Christmas and I thought I would have it like when it came out. And it's now been out a week and I still don't have my copy. But oh, man, that sucks. It's very. Yeah, because I'm like, I want to go buy it. I want to uh -huh. have it. I, I also feel like I don't want to. Bought it. Well, it's not Thanksgiving yet. You can't listen to it until it gets. Uh, yeah, well, that's an left. that's an interesting kind of like uh, we, yeah, we need to do a show on that the the the, the controversy of when when people you have to wait that. till the day after Thanksgiving, man. You know. Yeah, well, the, <clears throat> the Mexican grocery store by my house uh, actually last Thursday when I came to my uh, to go get something because they were open late till like midnight and they were playing Christmas music already. So mm -hmm. yeah, they're playing the Christmas music everywhere. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're going to be start playing it before Halloween, before you know it. And it's well, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're pushing it. They're but, pushing um, it. Anyway, so I, I want to just introduce you to our our audience uh, for anybody who is either been under a rock or in my case, like slightly ignorant about. I mean, I know a lot of things and then I missed out on a lot of things. But uh, uh, this this woman that we are talking to tonight is her name is Kathy McCarty. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. From Austin, Texas. Um, yes, I'm in Texas right now. Wonderful. So, How's the weather? Now we're there? talking. Mm. <laughs> well, you're, you're a musician. You're a visual uh -huh. artist. You played the anarchist daughter in Slacker, which my buddy Mike. Uh, I was because I was at. I was texting back and forth with him after I told him that we were we were going to be chatting. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, where was where were you in Slacker? And he, and he told me you were the anar anarchist daughter. Mm -hmm. which, it's not a particularly I, memorable performance. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, no, the, I mean, some people like it. But... You, yeah, no, the line that you say at the end, I forget what it was, but it was like, I, I don't know, it was a really good, a cool line. But anyway, I, have, I had one really cool line, which was we observed a shoplifter at the store and I said, she's in my ethics class. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, so that was nice. But I, 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 I was really kind of dumb. You know, I was, I don't know, maybe 26 years old, not very old. And, uh, and I'd been a, a rock star for a while. And, uh, I just figured that my natural star quality would come across, you know, on the big screen. And uh, I have ac absolutely no acting training whatsoever. And, uh, and then I was surprised that it was not particularly great. <laughs> and later on, I realized acting is something you have to actually study and learn about. Uh, yeah. You can't just figure that you're going to be great just because you, you know, have a good memory and can say your lines and you think you're going to be mesmerizing oh. or whatever. Although you I think Richard Linklater, it seems like he really does have a talent, though, for like just maybe being able to capture a vibe or capture a scene or capture a moment like you know so that it's you know like like i don't really think of slacker as much as you know it's more impressionistic uh it is and you know when i first saw it uh it seemed like a student film to me like yeah that was a pretty good student film you know that's uh -huh. kind of yeah. how i felt about it but uh but when i saw it recently like you know you know 25 or 30 years later i realized it's very funny it's really funny. And uh, I don't think I got that at the time because it just seemed like a documentary. <laughs> it just seemed like a documentary of how and where me and my friends lived. And it just seemed like, well, yeah, that's pretty accurate. You know, I, captured it, well, you I, know. As a kid growing up here in Chicago, I mean, that's what I always envision and yeah. kind of fantasize. I still haven't been to Austin, but I kind of like, you know, I envision Austin as kind of being this like 
mecca place where like everybody's cool or everybody's you know and I'm, well it, it used to be like that you know yeah uh, so i was gonna ask you about that like not really so much like that anymore you know yeah what's it like living kind of in austin which is kind of like more of like a a, a, a liberal city it's it, then, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like a completely liberal city yeah and then it, but it, it's the most liberal place by, you know it's most liberal right, by the rest of texas like is that like a miles and what was the question though I was, I was kind of like what's the what's the vibe like there as far as like is there like is it hostile between pe people from austin and the rest of the state or is it is politics not gotten into that much of the conversation for it, for people i think to tell you the truth I'm, I'm gonna have to be a little bit historical here uh you know the university of texas is here and so for a long time the uh, the uh, goal or the stated goal of the university of texas was to educate the people of texas ed educate children of texas and so uh when i got out of high school and you know for the previous hundred years before that um there was a law i guess that said that uh the university of texas had to accept everybody in the top half of their graduating class from any texas high school so uh, so pretty much it was, uh, you know, a regional state college, a big one and a good one. Uh, but then they decided at some point, maybe in the late 80s or 90s to try and be some sort of world class university. And they quit uh, doing that. Now, it's really hard to get in and it's very expensive. Where not, when I went, uh, it was very, very inexpensive. I think it was four hundred dollars a semester. And now it's like twenty thousand dollars a semester. So it's very different, very different now than it used to be. And uh, so essentially, everybody from every small town in Texas, and Texas is really big. Uh, people don't understand how big it is unless they've been here. I, uh, I yeah. actually, I it's bigger than many countries. It's really big. You can I've drive for eighteen through. hours and you do not get across it. Right. So it's big. No. And so no. that's a lot of kids. And so pretty much every kid who had any brains or looks or ambition came to Austin and uh, got educated and, and then decided they want to stay here because it was better when they came from. So, uh, so it's been a really liberal, educated, you know, high reading rate, you know, like high book sales sort of town, like, you know, forever since mm -hmm. 1910 or something. And so when you live in Austin, it's very liberal and you pretty much assume everyone you meet is reasonably nice and, and it's kind of like a bubble, you know, to a certain extent. But the minute you get onto the outskirts, you start meeting the uh, really racist, fucked up, backwards uh, yeah. people. Yeah. And uh, it used to be when I was younger that when uh, people from Austin, say, would just drive out to a small town near Austin to you know, buy peaches or just have a road trip or something, people were pretty nice. And since Trump was uh, installed, uh, those yeah. people are, yeah. are very, uh, very different now, and they're, and they're very hostile. And so sure. you For really sure. get a big dose of, uh, hey, America isn't as nice as it used to be uh, when you leave yeah. the city, you know? Yeah. Right. That didn't that work true. People used to be like, a, come spend your money problem. here, you know? And now they're kind of like, oh, get the fuck out of here, hippie, you know? Yeah. Does it does that affect the music scene at all? Like, is is are the musicians kind of like of, of different political views? And Oh, no, all the liberal, all the musicians are liberals. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, okay. And pretty <laughs> much everybody in the creative arts, I mean, not all of them, I, mean, I know a couple of it's really, I, I mean, you, you're hard pressed to think of like who are great. I, because I do this sometimes. I'm like, who are great? Like, I was listening to um, Charlie Daniels' Fire on the Mountain record yesterday, and like, you know, like I, I really enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed it as a kid, and then I get really sad because I'm like, you know, he, he was this really conservative person, and it, you know, didn't. Yeah, um, I think a lot of like, the. But it's like he, of... he didn't agree with this record either by the end. So is it wrong for yeah. me to listen to it, or you know? <laughs> Um, well, you know, a lot of the racism inherent in a, a lot of people's psyches used to fly under the radar a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, now it's, yep, a lot, yep. it's a lot more out there, you know, people feel oh, yeah. to, uh, to declare their uh, bizarre, sexist and racist views that they used to perhaps keep for mm -hmm. a, a limited audience of closer friends or something. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it's... But, in, yeah. but typically people who are musicians in Austin never played small towns anyway, because no one would come yeah. to see you. So uh, one thing that I think has always uh, kind of hampered uh, bands from Austin from getting nationally recognized is that it takes so fucking long to even drive to another big city. I mean, the closest yeah, city is, okay. is uh, three hours away. The yeah. next closest is four hours away. The next closest is like 10 hours away. 
Yeah. That closes us 12 well, hours. Right? So, it's not, so it's not like the East Coast or the West Coast where you can just go on a tour, a little tour, and hit a whole bunch of big cities. You just can't right. do that. <laughs> like if you're going to go yeah, tour. Like Urban, like, right? you're, you're, you have to like pretty much dedicate. Um, we're going to go in six weeks if we're going to get anywhere. You sure. know. Yeah, so, yeah. Did you guys ever play Chicago? Oh, we you played there ever- tons. Yeah, tons of times. Chicago okay. was kind of good because you could hit it when you're going east and west, you know, because it's right. uh, uh, although typically when we went west, uh, we didn't usually hit Chicago. Sometimes we would hit, um, you know, uh, some of the places in uh, New Mexico and Colorado on the way back. But right. but usually mm-hmm. Chicago, we would hit uh, when we're doing the East Coast because it's closer. Do, you know, do you remember who you played with at all at, uh, when you guys uh, played here? Can I throw some names maybe? Maybe, but I mean, I remember more the names of the clubs than the names of the other bands that we played. Oh, with. do you ever play the Cubby Bear? Yeah, tons of times. Okay, okay. Uh, Tuts? Yep. Okay. So, yeah, that's like the circuit there. Yeah, because yeah. there's, um, so Brian and I, of course, you know, we're like huge music fans and especially Chicago, which kind of like almost in a way like reminds me a little bit of the Austin music scene. Is like, it's like a very, you know, we have our thing, our, thing going on here you know i've been playing music we we've collectively for the last 30 years or so mm-hmm. and you know still active still you know in the scene yeah. and, but yeah it's you know like with austin and just yeah i, I always kind of always felt like okay you know similar footing like you know there's like a wide variety and of course everybody's generally you know kind of eccentric or mad or whatever and well and there's there was like you know there's kind of like an austin chicago connection too like man there like is you know, yeah, came, yeah, we came from Austin, but then you know, Jesus Lizard. became Jesus Lizard, yeah. And like we recorded, we recorded deal. with uh, we recorded with Steve Albini once, and stayed there, oh, okay, and hung out with the Scratch Acid guys. Scratch Acid, when they were um, you know, coming up, uh, we sure. uh, co build with them a, a good deal here in Austin, uh, and then they broke up, and and you know, the guys moved to Chicago, and and I don't think we ever played with a Jesus Lizard in Chicago, but we did hang out with them a little bit when we would go sure. through. And uh, and uh, like I said, we recorded with still with Albini once, but it never got released. It was just one track. It wasn't like a whole record or anything. Uh, but it was we were trying to you know establish you know some cred sure. <laughs> with uh, people that would care. And also Albini's a really nice nice guy and a really good producer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. anyway, so uh, we did that. And and uh, you know it's just a town that you always play in. You know, but one of the things that's true about musicians, and this might bring a uh, strike a chord with you is so when musicians get together we don't talk about music and yeah. we don't really talk about clubs that much what we talk about is what we ate and where we yeah. ate when we were on the road <laughs> so so mo- a lot of my memories of chicago are where i ate and what i had you know, oh yeah uh, that's what, what we care about that's what we care about you know and yeah so, well what did you have in chicago that you oh we had deep you, dish, you, we had deep dish pizza of course of course, because that's okay. what's from there, you know, with, with their favorites and sure. hot dogs and hot dogs. Mm. Mm. And uh, that's what I remember mostly, you know, I mean, okay. I, I'm, I'm, almost every town, though, like we were always uh, on such a thin margin. We we never yeah. made money touring uh, of course. and yeah. we seldom yeah. stayed in motels. We flopped with people. We asked if we could go home and sleep on their floor is what we did mostly. And, uh, and, and even in my solo tour, that's what I did. And uh, I mean, when I had a, a band uh, uh, in the nineties and uh, so uh, we didn't have a lot of money to spend, so we wouldn't go to any place that was fancy, but, uh, but usually you'd find some really cool place that wasn't too expensive, you know, and that would be a place you would look forward to going the next time you were there. Like sure. yeah, we, when we played in Minneapolis, we always ate at this Thai place. You know, that was really like it was like four dollars, and like you could get it was great, you yeah, know, yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> so, like you mentioned, bands and musicians in Austin, it, it's like kind of one of the few few scenes where you could probably make a living just playing. No, music. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> not the not anymore. I guess. Not anymore. Okay. No, never, never, never. One thing about Austin is that every single hot shit guitar player in Texas, which is a lot of them, a lot of them. Sure. Moved to Austin. Okay, all of them. And so, like, you could, like, even people I know who are, like, world-class guitar players say things like this. You could throw a rock on South Congress and hit someone who plays better than me, you know? So there's yeah. so many musicians here that the people that live here have always considered music to be practically free. And during the 80s, I mean, the typical, like, cover charge for, say, there would be a, a, a show, right, that had a 1,000 people at it, and it would be, like, the Butthole Surfers, Scratch Acid, and Glass Eye, right? 
cover was two dollars by the time you play the sound man and parcel it all out everybody's making like 10 bucks you know yeah. <laughs> so so nobody could ever make a living here and everybody even now like people that are making a living playing music they they make their living or did before the shutdown you know on the road and you come back to austin and play for fuck for, you know bullshit money yeah. you know and it's okay because i mean that we can afford to go out and see a bunch of people so you know it's good to, it's good for the community in a way like i don't have to worry about going to see people and having to cough up 20 bucks every time so that's good yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. i mean a lot of a lot of shows are tips only you know and so you, and typically though you get drunk and you give them a 20 <laughs> you know but uh at the same time it's like you know the get, getting in is not the problem and there's just always been except for like i said during the shutdown just a ton of great options you know when you want to go out and see music in austin it's well, still there's still a ton of really good bands and really good players and really good performers here it's just uh it's gotten so expensive like it used to be typical typically in the 80s if you were going to rent an apartment or a house it ran about a hundred dollars a bedroom a month so it was very easy to live here and be a creative person and now it's we're more expensive than los angeles it's so expensive here now i don't know how younger people are doing it i'm i live in a dump that is behind me you can kind of see a little bit of the dumpy house i live in but uh i bought a really cheap house for cheap when they were when they were cheap and so i can stay here you know but uh yeah, but yeah. Unless, you did, unless you did that i don't mean i don't understand how people are paying thirty five hundred dollars a month for efficiency i'm just like how can you how could you even live the jobs yeah. don't pay that much. You know, it's like the, the average wage is not what the average apartment costs. But I guess that's true everywhere, kind of now. Yeah. Uh, we always felt kind of like poor because we had to live as adults with roommates. Like, I mean, up until I was almost 40, I mean, I just lived in a house with a bunch of people. And, you know, not the same house. You know, change every once in a while. But but mostly yeah. like you, rented, you rented a bedroom and it was about $100. And then you had to, you know, pay everything else, car insurance and stuff like that. But, you know, it was, it was you know, this, uh, you know, adult, uh, mul you know, uh, roommate situation sort of thing, unless you were married or had a significant relationship or something. And then you would just live with them, you know, but split it. And, uh, and now, man, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how people are doing it. I really honestly don't know. The people that I know who are musicians who don't own a house are just in a really long-term rental situation with some landlord who's reasonably cool, who's like, yeah. oh, I guess I guess 800's okay, you know, which to me even sounds crazy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. when I had a mortgage on this house, and it was very cheap, as I mentioned, because it's a dump, uh, <laughs> it was $400 a month was my mortgage payment. I think something like eight or $900 is like a fancy house in my mind. And that's right. like, no, it, there's nothing. You could buy nothing in this town for that much money. I mean, you couldn't even buy a bed on an unimproved lot for that much money. So do you think artists make more money merchandising, like getting the opportunity to merchandise then, than from actually... Uh... Well, it depends on what area you're talking about. Um, I yeah. would say right, right now... Oops, wait a minute. There we go. You went away for a minute. I think my, my computer... I didn't touch the keys enough. Uh, uh, right now, what I understand is that the people who are making a living are doing it off of merchandise. And when we toured, even in the 80s, that's how we paid our gas, was T-shirts. T-shirts and, to a certain extent, CDs and records. Um, but we were in a, we had a sh kind of shitty deal with our um, record label. And so mm -hmm. when they gave us product, we had to pay for it. Like, they didn't give it to us for yeah. free. And, uh, and then, they, you know, and we never made any money because the contracts back then were truly criminal. And... Uh, right. They're better they're now. They're, more, they're, they're like 50-50 now is what I understand. But back then they were like 90-10 and all the expenses came out. Holy of your cow. So you, you, never, you never saw anything. And that was boilerplate. You know, it's and you were on an indie label, label, right? I was on you, Bar None. Right? Bar, and they label. were a well-thought-of label, you know, Bar None. Yeah. And uh, they, had good, they had good talent. And, and Glenn is a nice guy. But, uh, you know, he wasn't about to uh, leave that money sitting on the table, you know. I mean, <laughs> he was allowed to have it, so he kept it. And uh, and uh, we just we, we got our recording advances, and that was it. That's all we ever got. Then we would get these records that we would get for, you know, we'd have to pay for and, and sell them on the road. So, yeah, the T-shirts really helped. Like, the T-shirts was what... <laughs> T-shirts was what paid for the gas and, you know, whatever else we had to do. But we usually saved money from our day jobs, you know, to go on tour. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I, I think like toward the end, maybe we were breaking even, but we never b got bumped up to the level where we were, there was any actual profit from it, you know. And the right. idea back then was that you toured to sell the units, to move the units of the records, the product. But we didn't get that money either, you know. Right. Uh, and now, I mean... When, during the shutdown, I thought it was truly insane that Congress didn't do anything because now people don't get anything for the recorded product because you get like, you know, a one fortieth of a cent for every download, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, then, yeah. so the idea before the shutdown was that uh, 
well, you're going to make money touring. But then when everything shut down, you couldn't do that either. So, so every musician in Austin was looking at homelessness, you know, because you couldn't make money at anything. There was nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And the city put aside several million dollars to dole out and it was gone in 15 minutes, you know, because there's a lot of musicians here and, and no one was making anything. And at, at, at a certain point, I put in a thing of like, yeah, I'd like some of the money, you know, I'm a musician. I'm a full -time musician. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. and they said after about two hours, they said, OK, we're only we're only looking at people with kids under the age of 10. I mean, because we got to prioritize people with kids who are starving. So you're getting nothing. And like, you know, not against that. I mean, yes, people with kids under 10 should probably get seen first. But, it, but as far as like the city being known for its music and the, the, degree, the degree to which the city actually supports it is a chasm like the uh, Grand Canyon. I mean, the city does nothing. Nothing. You know, like I said, just like Chicago. Chicago is the yeah. city. I, I've, yeah. I, I've ranted about this because, you know, obviously Chicago has a blues, jazz, rock. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's not, a, and there's not a blues museum here. There's not a jazz museum here. There's, <laughs> yeah. there's like yeah. if you go to Memphis, it's like they, they'll, yeah. you'll see, you'll, you'll know why Memphis yeah. is such a re renowned music city. But like here, it's like, I mean, the the club life is good, and if you could yeah. find the right shows, but yeah, it's Chicago's, and it seems like like you said, Austin is is not really though they value the. The commerce it brings in, they they don't really acknowledge how like the greats that have come yeah. from there. They don't acknowledge you or everybody no. else. And is the Daniel Johnston uh, mural still up? I, it is. Don't. Thank God. It's still that, there, uh, but I mean, he never got paid for it, as far as I know. Maybe he got some free sure. deals from the place. It was yeah. There. I don't know, but you know, it's it's. Uh, I think I think there's just kind of a general feeling that if you're stupid enough to go into the arts, you get what you deserve, or something like that, from you know the overall American society. Or if you're any yeah. good, you'd make money, or something like that. When it's really like ah, that's not actually true. Uh, I, I, I remember a friend of mine was telling me he saw he was in the airport in Austin, and Doug Doug Salmon, Augie Myers were just you know kind of playing in the the airport for. The you know, airport like, actually does do something to support musicians. The airport, there, there is an or airport gig that's ongoing. That uh, okay. that oh. you can play, and they do pay you some money, but I don't know if that's the city. It might just be the airport. But I have played that. You know, I got I yeah. got paid. I don't remember what they paid you. Maybe two fifty or four hundred dollars or something like that. Still pretty pretty decent. You know. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you can see some real talent at our at our at our airport. That's for sure. And, uh, well, I would fly to Austin, except my ex wife lives there, and I don't. I think I'm not welcome in there. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, doubt, I doubt really there's a restraining. It's a big city. She'll probably never know. Yeah. No, no. I mean, it, it could be the freakest thing to run into her, but yeah. Um, so there's my connection, I guess. To so, so, uh, so I guess it didn't end uh, in a friendly way. Unfortunately, no. Wow. no. But it's too bad. That was a long time ago, and hopefully she's somewhere around there doing fine. But, um, um, but yeah, it was. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> Well, with the album, so the albums come out now on vinyl. The um, a dog's eye or dead dog's eyeball. That's the name of it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it's finally come out on now. This is the first. It it never came out on vinyl in the '90s, correct? No, it came out only on CD, and uh, and and I was uh, I was really smart. Uh, it took me a long time to wisen up, but I I did I did do one smart thing uh, when I signed because uh, Glass Eye had broken up, so I was not signed on Bar None, but they wanted to put out this record. And uh, and I, I and I said okay, you know, because they they put up the recording advance and stuff. And uh, and uh, I put one thing into my contract extra though that uh, I had not put into any of my other contracts. It was still a shitty contract, but it had this one thing. It said, <laughs> if this record goes out of print for more than twelve months, the rights revert to Kathy. Because I had known so many people whose records had gone out of print, weren't available. People wanted them; they wanted their record to be in print, but the label wouldn't print it, you know, or the label went out of business or whatever you know and i just thought well if you're not going to keep it in print then i own it and so that eventually happened and uh it had gone out of print and i and with spotify it's kind of hard to figure what does out of print yeah, mean but i think that legally it means what it used to mean like do you have any physical product you know uh apparently so uh yeah. i i was on facebook one day and i was just horsing around on facebook talking to people and and someone said you know i, I wish that would come out in vinyl and i thought that's a good idea <laughs> Maybe I could put it out in vinyl. I think I think there's enough people to buy, you know, a thousand of them anyway, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so I got in touch with Glenn, and 
indeed the rights had reverted to me. He hadn't told me that they'd reverted to me, but they had. And so yeah. I own it. So, so then I put it out on vinyl, but it was a very, very expensive undertaking because um, it's very long and uh, it has to be a double album. So all the costs yeah. were double. And I also got like the best mastering wizard in the history of the world to remaster it, which I'm very proud of. It was Joe Gaswort. Uh, and he uh, is very picky. He doesn't do everybody. I mean, he's really, really, really picky. But he did agree to do mine, but that was kind of expensive because I had it mastered separately for vinyl, CD, and download because most people don't do that. And they take yeah. their CD mastering and they put it on vinyl. It sounds like garbage. So people are out there buying vinyl thinking, I'm buying vinyl because vinyl sounds better. And they get this thing that sounds worse than a CD because it wasn't mastered for vinyl. So yeah. they're dumb. And uh, the people well, that buy those records are dumb. You know? uh, but, uh, the, the remastering cost about seven grand. So that was a lot. Yeah. And uh, and then I got it done on heavy vinyl, and I you know, just did it up really well, like a collector's edition. Yeah. And each unit cost me about thirty five dollars, uh, so it's expensive. I sell it for fifty. Uh, and I but I also had CDs made, and they're like fifteen, like every other CD in the world, and they're mastered for CD, so they sound good too. So I've got something for people who are just drunk and want to check it out, you know, yeah. at a show, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. And I got T-shirts. I got real nice T-shirts. So. But, but the real the real thing is the vinyl, because for people who really love vinyl, having a copy of this record that is a beautiful yeah. sounding record uh, done kind of master, yeah. masterfully and put out on vinyl, you know, it's really a treat, you know, it's a real treat for people. So and uh, and reception's been, you know, people are blown away because like, you literally can hear like the skin on the piano player's hand touching the keys. I mean, you can hear everything. Yeah. And I'm just big, great. big. It's and there's something like. It's like it, it's ha has such a nice warm sound to the record. Like it you, does. You, it feels like you're you're in the room, and yeah. there's like a lot of space, oh, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, between the musicians, letting each other breathe. It, it, it's yeah. a really. I remember you, you mentioned in in other interviews about how you, you made the record kind of like with your mom in mind to kind of like I did how yeah. present yeah. these songs to yeah. to your mom who didn't and in uh, which touched me because my mom. Um, also, I, I remember playing songs of uh, songs of pain. And oh dear! One day, and she's like, uh, you know, she was like, "What is this?" Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, well, you know, yeah. he's yeah. this amazing songwriter." No, yeah. this is awful. <laughs> like, awful. Like, Please turn it off. You hear the, you know, uh, whereas I hear Neil Young and I hear Brian Wilson and I hear Paul right. McCartney and I hear. Oh, there we go. You know, I hear Beach Boys. All, yeah, all I hear. Boys. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have a thing on our show that eventually. We, to, like try we try to guess how long it will be till the beach boys reference happens but so so every time like you know so right now it's been 30 minutes since we that we've mentioned the beach boys so yeah. wow well, um, i did good I yeah, did good. yeah that's, that's like doing a really long plank or something yeah I made it 30 minutes beach without the beach boys i love the beach boys the beach boys were the very first concert i ever went to although at the time there was only one original beach boy in the band in the oh. mid-70s but uh when i went to my Which first one was concert, that was that mike love the, the I don't movie. I don't know I mean I was so silly you know I was like a teenager you know I was like yeah. I was 14 or 15 so I didn't even know it wasn't the real Beach Boys until you know later <laughs> but uh was and also it was in some you know enormous you know arena stadium where they were sure big, yeah you know, my band this big you know so, so what but, what uh, but yeah I like the, I love the Beach Boys yeah. pardon me uh so what what did your mom think of the record well you know um she thought it was sounded like horrible garbage like a crazy person making horrible noise, you know. And uh, no, I mean, you're but she felt that about your record, or oh, no, no, that's what she thought about Daniel, yeah, yeah, that's what she thought about, she thought Daniel. about Daniel, yeah, yeah. Well, How, uh, you know, what was her response to your record? I, I think that she really liked a lot of it, uh, and I, I think she yeah. understood better what, what he was doing. It didn't become her favorite record or anything, but it, but she could stand it, you know, yeah. she could listen to it, and uh, and you know, uh, one thing that I that I think is lost now is that when daniel came out with his tapes nobody but nobody was releasing yeah. music that sounded anything like that now that's like a genre of like lo-fi or whatever you call it of people just the outsider in their bedroom mm -hmm. outsider stuff whatever but at the time it was like absolutely unheard of for anyone to release anything that sound that sounded like it was recorded on a on a you know press button cassette player you know and uh, and they were just you know playing out of tune guitar or whatever so so i think it's kind of lost who for people who come to daniel now they've heard things kind of like it before you know if they've never heard him but at the time like 
there was nothing like Daniel. No, sure. And so I'm sure that my mom was, you know, completely, I mean, she could barely listen to Bob Dylan, you know, studio <laughs> record. She was like, oh, I prefer Joan Baez's versions, you know, so yeah. <laughs> they just wanted things to sound good, you know, or sound pretty, you know, sound, sound pretty. And, but, but, uh, yeah. And obviously it's like the, well, when I was talking about how you, you know, like any fan of Daniel Johnson, you know, no matter the, the sound quality and obviously like the pain that, that, mm-hmm. that he's, that's going, that's coursing through him and just coming out. It's like, there is the beauty. And I think, you know, there's like, obviously you recognized it. And the fact yeah, I think that, that you know, songwriters listen to him differently than other people, sure. you well, know, I think because when, when you're a songwriter, you're listening to the song. And so when I first heard his stuff, I, you know, I was already a songwriter and I just heard great songs. I didn't really care about how they were done, you know, but, uh, and, and that's one reason he got most of his traction that he got was with uh, other bands covering his music at first. Yeah. Because the people that were songwriters in the band would listen to it and be like, this is fantastic. I love this song, Walking the Cow. Let's do it, you know? And then they would yeah. do it in the style of their band, you know, or whatever. And he loved that. He, he preferred that, really, to performing himself. Uh, yeah. Were there any other versions... People, he, other people yeah. cover him. Were there any versions he, he'd mentioned that, that he particularly liked that, that you remember? Oh, you mean like, did Daniel like any of the ones on my record or did he like well, other Well, ones? I assume he, he liked your, but like you were saying, he liked when other people covered, was there any covers? He, oh, he, he, he loved did. it when everybody, he loved it when everybody did it. I mean, he like, he, he, Daniel was a really big music appreciator. Um, yeah. And I've learned a lot from him in, in that, in that way where like even the shittiest cover band in town, like cover one of his songs, he would love it. And he'd be like, I love their version. It's great. And, right. Uh, right. and he really really loved music and loved listening to it and he had thousands like 10,000 20,000 records uh and and he just was a complete like he just devoured music and uh, film uh yeah. and art and visual art like just never endingly and when whereas, he was just like I never got to meet him but but it just like kind of the constant machine of our you know just our always creating what you know whether it yeah. was drawing or what, whatever he was like he, he was more not, like that than anyone i've ever met yeah I mean, he could like, not be first, create not creating he couldn't he couldn't stop making art long enough to hold a job or sleep or yeah have a, you know it's like he was like literally the first time i met him and i was like a big hero to him because i was a big local rock star and he was you know just moved to town and he still just was drawing the whole time he was talking to me like he couldn't stop drawing, you know, he had to draw his stacks and stacks of drawings, you know, in his efficiency that were, you know, like six or seven feet high, <laughs> practically, you know, and he just had millions of drawings and millions of notebooks full of drawings. And he had, you know, what, tons and tons of head tapes and, you know, just. What do you think it's lost? Like the, he's almost kind of gotten to that icon status where, you know, like the, the legend um, will, I mean, the, the man's no longer living and we're still talking about the legend, you know, all the, uh, you know, the, the movie obviously. And what, what do you think it's lost when people, when, when they, th- they see the person more as, as those, those story, you know, these collections of stories or that, that kind of artist. I don't really you know. know. I mean, yeah. like I do, I do know that like, you know, Daniel could draw a really, really big crowd almost anywhere in the world you know, during the final years of his life. And so he was, you know, immensely popular. And a lot of times he he was never, in my opinion anyway, a very good performer. Uh, there was some years around the year 2000 where he was pretty decent. Like we would, you know, play and sing okay. But but toward the end, I mean, he was so physically ill and mentally ill that, that he might go out on stage and do three songs rather badly and everyone would be perfectly happy with it, you know? So yeah. Yeah. people were not happy with it, but, but he was never... It was never his favorite thing to perform. Uh, I right. mean, he liked, he liked, uh, in a way, it was kind of like he got what he wanted, which was to be a rock star, you know? And yeah, like he manifested the thing and then yeah. it actually happened. Right? And when it actually happened, it really wasn't that fun for him. Although, I mean, there were certain aspects of it that he, that he did enjoy at various different times, you know, but. Uh, uh, it feels like. A lot it, of the time, it, I think it was kind of torture like, for him, though, really going on the road. It, it felt like um that like he had kind of different groups pulling at him you know or or different right different people wanting different things from him or um well he was so isolated that i don't think he was really subject to that too much yeah uh, 
he lived, you know, his parents. It's like it seemed like he was coming from like the the religious, you know, the religious background and in in uh, uh, just other uh, like he he was always in in different scenes at different times. It seemed. No, his, the religious thing was always a big deal for him. He wanted to be a preacher yeah. when he was young, and uh, and it, it, it never wasn't a thing for him. But when he got really mentally ill and delusional, um, it became a torture for him because he thought he was going to hell and he thought yeah. he saw Satan all the time and he attacked people because he thought they were Satan and and uh, it was. It, I think I, I don't think that the the religion that he was raised in, which was very very black and white and evangelical, was very helpful to him when he was. Yeah, the, yeah, well, especially because there, there, you know, when you, you're you, some of the stuff that he he was representing with is, um, st you know, stuff that was coming, you know, he was coming from the, the Bible, like they he was they were teaching yeah. these things in church. You well, know, it was, like, was very real to him, you know. And yeah. Also, after he left Austin, he left Austin to go into the loony bin, as he calls it. And so he was in the loony bin off and on after he left Austin uh, for the rest of his life. And when he wasn't in the loony bin. He was living with his parents, who were evangelicals, and uh, was completely immersed in that culture and going to church twice a week and was, stuff like that. And he didn't have a computer, and he wasn't allowed to answer the phone. So, uh, no, so he was pretty, no. pretty, pretty cut off from uh, from other people. And there were certain people that his parents uh, approved of and would let visit him, but mostly they all lived in Austin, so they have to drive to Houston and back. And yeah. so it's kind of a kind of a uh, you know, we have to commit a whole day to that. So, so he did see some of his friends, like my friend Brian from Glass Eye, and me, and my husband mm -hmm. David Thornberry, who you may remember that name from uh, from his uh, MTV appearance. Uh, David uh, was his best friend in, in West Virginia, and uh, and then Bill Anderson and uh, Todd Wolfson. I mean, so various people would go. Uh, Marie Javins from Marvel Comics was a good friend, and so so various so we, people would visit him. But a lot of times, only once or twice a year, you know, because it was kind of a big deal to do and yeah. uh so, so he saw some people who managed to uh you know pass the test of you know we're not here to exploit your son you know we we were friends before uh and yeah. uh and his family has always liked me so that's nice you know yeah. <laughs> did, did you did they felt um, safe around well, it was almost like wesley like kind of reminds me of a little bit of uh we had a local guy wesley willis that i've mm -hmm. ever heard of him yeah oh uh, yeah I've, I've heard him and i've heard some of his music yeah, yeah, almost. I mean, not you know. Yeah, also visual artist, also prolific. Kind of. Yeah, He's it's dealing with mental illness. Yeah, um, yeah. and yeah, kind of like that. That idea of a support network, like, like they're, they, they had like it seemed like in Austin he had a support network, but then. Um, mm, it more like in Austin he was like you know a member of the rocks, uh, punk, new way you know whatever you want to call our scene. Well, right? Like the the, the, the alternative Twitter music scene, the alternative music scene. He was a member of it. But I don't think anyone yeah. was really like looking out for him except his manager. Yeah, when, he had, he, when he had Jeff Tardik, when he had Jeff Tardikoff as his manager, Jeff looked out for him, and he was the best manager in the history of the world. I mean, he was fantastic, uh, yeah. really, really honest guy, and all he cared about was what was best for Daniel. And, and he still, he, and still, he never even he never even took any pay ever. I mean, he just had a job during the day and let Daniel yeah. lost Daniel's money for him. And uh, I mean, he might have taken a little bit eventually toward the end, but uh, before he got fired, but. Uh, <laughs> He was fired by Daniel essentially for being Jewish, which is crazy and uh, it was sad. Wow. <laughs> it was wow. sad and uh, ruined. You know, I don't really... mean to laugh, but it just yeah. That, no, that is, it's that totally is... dumb. I mean, Jeff. I mean, Daniel knew he was Jewish. Uh, uh, it was just silly. I mean, it was what it was a situ It was a shitty situation. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'll tell you all about it if you want to hear my take on it. But uh, sure. Well, but, uh, something that you said just a minute ago is is key. Is like yeah, it's like nobody was looking out for him. And, Kind of Not like, necessarily. You know, he was he was considered a, you know he was like what 26 27 years old people considered him a grown person and uh, I mean everyone cared about him I mean not maybe not everyone but I mean a lot of people cared about him a lot uh, but there were other people who may, might not have so much I mean somebody gave him acid and he lost his mind and uh, I mean yeah. nobody I know would have given him acid but somebody did and right. so then he lost his mind and, and went into the loony bin and uh, and after that Ooh. his family took care of him and I have to say those people his family they lived up to their beliefs. I mean, pretty much taking Daniel back into the home ruined his parents' retirement completely because they had to yeah. uh, take care of this crazy person for the rest of their lives and well, didn't they, get to enjoy their golden years really that much, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I think uh, it, was a, it was a sacrifice. Movie, it was a real sacrifice. Even in the movie, I think yeah. they, they, 
you know, they, they, they talk about that struggle, right? They're worried, you know, in, in the movie, they express that concern of what, what will happen when he's gone, which, or what, when we're gone, which I yeah. think is, is something that the parents of, of people with mental illness, you know, have to deal with, you know, a lot well, of times. They, they, were, they were kind of lucky because Daniel has four siblings. And so yeah. he, he has a brother named uh, Dick, who's a nice guy. And uh, Dick kind of took over when Bill died, although Mabel continued to live for a while. That's his mother. And eventually Mabel died. And then it was a little bit too much for Dick after Mabel died to take care of Daniel. And so uh, one of his sisters, Margie, stepped in. Uh, and so for the last few years of his life, um, Dick and Margie took care of him. And Daniel had his own house. So Margie would go over and she was in charge of the food and the medicine and keeping it clean and everything. And Dick handled all the business stuff. So, 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 he, so it was uh, a continued family project to take care of Daniel, but uh, you know, they all, they all uh, sacrificed to do it. Although I think for Dick and Margie, um, at least they got paid something because Daniel was making a lot of money by then. So it wasn't mm -hmm. as it had, to, it wasn't as self-sacrificing as it had been when, he first went home uh, because, uh, I mean, I'm not sure when he started being self-supporting. It wasn't too long after the Fun album, but but um, for a long, you know, the most of the money I think that came to Daniel's people licensing his stuff for television and movies. But some of that, some yeah. of that can be a pretty big payout, you know. And uh, I mean, I don't think he made ever made that much money off my record because it didn't sell that much. Uh, but my record was good in the sense that it introduced a whole generation of people to uh to daniel's music which and then the tar the target i think i heard about your record through uh the target commercial actually mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, speedy motorcycle now is that that's not i don't think that was me i don't think that was me oh, that's not you I, I, no i think that might have been a yola tango's version oh or okay i mean there, there's a lot of other people that have covered him sure uh, i would certainly remember if i ever gotten okay. a payout like that uh, okay, I was. Uh, I, I think my version of living life was in uh, the Linklater movie Before Sunrise. And, okay, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was that was uh, where some people, you know, first heard his music. And I know that one thing that's really charming, I think, about Dead Dog's Eyeball is that um, it was super popular with kids. I mean, kids, yeah. little little kids loved it. And I meet grown-ups all the time who are about 30 who are like, I love this record when I was a little kid. And if you think about Daniel's music, it makes sense, you know, because in a lot of ways, Daniel was very childlike. And uh, and so uh, so there's a whole lot of people that grew up with his music because of my record. And then also people like like your mom and my mom who like maybe would never have been able to stand it, but they could listen to something like Living Life and be like, oh, I like this song, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's just that one, the one tribute record, Doc. Uh, covered and discovered where like one disc was the Daniel versions and one disc was the interpretations uh, and you know so, some of those mm -hmm. were you know really you know some people went really far with it it was uh I really enjoy hearing other people's covers because I remember hearing a, one of the songs that he wrote when he was completely insane it was called Devil Town and it's about Austin yeah we were just playing but, that before it, you came on yeah, yeah. and he, it's like you know I, his version is like I was living in a devil town didn't know it was a devil town, you know, and it's a bit folky, you know, just him saying yeah, it. Right. Yeah, it's and then I heard this version of somebody did where they just totally did it metal and it was so good. It was wow. such a great version. And I was like, I never even liked this song until I heard this cover. Now I think it's great. Well, because <laughs> the melody is what, what is amazing. Like Bright Eyes, I think, does it like as a kind of like mm -hmm. folk sing along. And it, right. but those melodies. Oh, I didn't, like, I didn't know that. I know those guys and I didn't even know. Even yeah, they, no, yeah, yeah. They do a good version of it as well, and it's it's just. I gotta, I've got to, I've got to go download that or something because I, I, I did not, I did not realize. I didn't meet. I didn't. I mean, I never. I don't. I never uh, saw Bright Eyes, but um, I later on met De met Will Johnson. Okay. And uh, and so uh, and I'm a big fan of his, and uh, and then people are like, oh well, he got famous with Bright Eyes and Centromatic and everything, and I'm like, who? <laughs> like I, I don't yeah, yeah. know about him. Uh, that's, the monsters that's, of folk. The Monsters of Folk, exactly. And, you know, one time, uh, one of those guys from uh, Centromatic, uh, it wasn't Will, but it was, uh, who are the guys in that? Uh, Colin, is that the right name? Uh, there's one guy that it has a pretty big name. On oh, the own. Monsters of uh, Folk. It was Connor. It was the dude Connor, from, Connor like, Obers. Was Connor, Connor Obers. Obers. Connor Obers. My Morning Connor Jacket Obers. guy, J James. And it was Will. Connor Obers. I remember now. 
So Connor oh, Owens was playing this huge theater here in town. Like it was a, a bit, one of those big theaters where like the Blue Man Group or somebody like that would. Perform. Sure. Yeah, they played here at the the big room here at the auditorium too. Yeah, so. really big. And so they had Daniel open for him. And uh, oh, wow. I I didn't I didn't know who Connor Oberst was, but uh, we were invited to the Daniel part, and so we met Dick for, and Daniel for dinner, and, and then we went over to the show and everything. And uh, I was kind of like, why isn't Daniel headlining? I don't, I don't really understand yeah. why this other guy's headlining. And it turned out to be one of those guys, you know. That I was like, wow. oh, they're really, they're really big. <laughs> I'll have to remember that because I, I I have a friend who's friends with Connor the the Nebraska Mafia as I call him. Mm-hmm. So I'll have to, next if if I do find myself backstage again somewhere with Connor, I'll have to mention that about the fact that he played that Daniel opened for them. Right? That's wild. Yes. That's, yeah. That is and that was cool. that was after they were you know obviously big enough to to be having him open for them. You know. Sure. Yeah. So, so they obviously like you know we're big fans of his. You know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and that particular night, I didn't stay to see Connor Oberst for some reason that was really technically important. I can't remember. It was like it wasn't like I had to go to work because I, that wasn't it. But it was I had to do something. So I you know saw sure. Daniel and he took off. Uh, uh, yeah. and, but anyway, so there's a lot of really great people yeah. besides myself, you know, who've covered Daniel stuff, and yeah. uh, you know, who are more famous than I am, which is not fair. Well, what are your, but... <laughs> your thoughts about the, the documentary? Oh, I think it's great. Uh, we know when you know somebody and they're your friend and mm-hmm. someone makes a movie about them you're a little concerned about like is it going to be accurate you know right like, yeah are they going to are they going to present this accurately and i thought that those two guys uh jeff and jeff Wersing and uh and his partner his name is escaping me right this second but i do know it uh, they did a phenomenally accurate job i mean and it was really really hard to get a you know a rounded a well-rounded picture of daniel across uh and they did such an amazing job. I mean, I really felt like it was. Probably like, oh, there you go. Uh, it's probably like the most accurate, you know, um, documentary that I've ever seen, and especially from you know uh, having been there. And I mean, like yeah. the part that was all about his time growing up in West Virginia, um, my husband knew about because he grew up with him there. So we had an insight into whether that was accurate, and then the stuff in Austin I knew all about, and. Uh, and I just thought it was great. I mean, I just thought, it, I still think it's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. Yeah, I think, because well, yeah. it portrays everybody as full, you know, like, like it's it's easy to be like, oh, the crazy fundamentalist Christians who I don't mm-hmm. agree with. But but then like, like you said, they're, they're great parents, you know, like they're, 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 you know, they're putting up with they, a lot. They, they put their money where their mouth was and they, you know, yeah. they, they, they um, did a good job. And, uh, and they were and just, very, very nice people, uh, you know, in in the ways that are probably most important. Um, yeah, I don't know sure. all the ways. There are some things that they did that I'm not crazy about, but uh, but um, but in general, um, I think that uh, I respect them a great deal. Is there, um, you know, are there are there plans for any future Daniel product to come out or? Well, um, that's one of the things that I'm not that happy about is that uh, my friend Brian uh, spent a decade driving out to Waller, Texas every weekend to record Daniel and do it the way Daniel wanted, which was, he would say, what do you want, this, what, do you, what instruments do you want on this or how do you want to do it? And then he would do it. And uh, he has three Daniel records in the can and uh, the family won't let him release them. And the reason that they're giving is that uh, we don't think that this is what Daniel wanted, which is exactly the opposite of the truth. So. Uh, mm. that's that's one of the business decisions that i don't think is that great that uh dick has made and uh and, uh, and i think i mean because uh, he did uh brian produced uh is and is and was uh, I, I can never remember the title the 2009 i think he did uh rejected unknown that one. oh rejected unknown okay yeah uh, and uh and then he has oh, yeah, one Jason called Faulkner did, did yeah. is and and okay so yeah rejected unknown which which is really one of one of the better ones i mean as far as like I a thematic so. album yeah. you know he's got funeral girl and you know yeah yeah he's, all the, brian's a great producer he's my producer uh he's great yeah. and i think he's the best producer in the world and uh and he's also like you know really super good at the production thing which is like this what do you want to do let's, let's make it happen not not yeah. his own idea on top of it or something like that and oh, uh, so cool. he has a record called if that's completely ready to go and uh they won't let him re- 
release it, uh, which I think is uh, insane. And uh, and it's well, other than that, Daniel... other than the three albums that Brian has in the can, I don't think there's anything that's not released. Yeah. I think that's so. Cool. Yeah. Well, the three albums is is a, is a fair bit. So hopefully. Oh, it's a lot. And every once in a while, if you go to Brian's uh, Facebook, every once in a while he'll he'll post one of the songs off of that on there, if you want to hear some of it. Uh, because yeah. It's so following him. Yeah. In yeah. his in his own way, he's trying to make a little noise about it. But he got a lawyer, and he, you know, did everything he could do, and they, he he just can't get around the fact that the family doesn't want it out there. And they they say it's because you know it's uh, not what Daniel wanted, which untrue so yeah. That's yeah. Well, and i think daniel knew knew like kind of envisioned what you know deserves is as of the stature he's kind of at like that's just kind of stuff that comes out later on you know after the person's gone you they if they have stuff that can be released i think it, it's good for the fans to experience it's, good, it's good to have that stuff out there if they can you know um, unless they can like extreme reason why why they didn't want it really you know i think yeah i mean all i can do is uh you know work on dick about it because he likes me yeah. you know so i can suggest to him yeah. like, you know, maybe you might want to let this stuff see the light of day because it's uh really good but uh you know uh like i said uh you know dick is uh kind of in charge of daniel's legacy and um and he has a, a bit of an agenda in uh, my opinion which is he he wants to present to the world uh, how religious Daniel was. And that's not a lie. Mm. Daniel sure. was very religious. And a lot of his songs, if you listen to them, they have a spiritual message. Uh, that's something that, that he was doing. But, uh, but, but I think that uh, he, the family was not real happy with the documentary because it gave you know, a very balanced view. Uh, it didn't whitewash any of Daniel's uh, exploits. And, right. uh, and I think that the family kind of prefers a version that's cleaned up a little bit, and uh, and that that has, you know, now that Daniel isn't even around, um, I mean, uh, perhaps they will succeed at this. Uh, it's hard yeah. to say, but, but most people who get involved with uh, with it uh, tend to uh, tap out after a while because because it's so iffy. Sure, sure. But before I forget. Um... So obviously you are a great interpreter of Daniel Johnson and obviously, but your own music as well is amazing. Um, in particular, Thank uh, you. Another, <laughs> another day in the sun, that whole record was, you know, checking out. I'm so glad time. that you were aware of it. Uh, Cause I, it, it really I, yeah, did no, not I have, get you know, out there very far. Uh, but yeah, uh, no, new shoes. And, yeah. New great shoes. It's a great that, album. <laughs> it's a very good. Was that also produced by, uh, by Brian? Yeah, so it's, all, it's also Brian produced Gaines? by Brian. And uh, what, what happened was this, uh, you know, we were in Glass Eye, we were a very popular band, and sure. uh, we had a lot of good songs, and we were trying to get a better record deal than the one we had. And uh, things didn't go well, and uh, we ended up breaking up. But we had a lot of stuff written. And after about seven years, I said, Brian, uh, uh, can I have my songs <laughs> from the unreleased, you know, unrecorded Glass Eye record to put out? And he said I could, and so at that point I kind of needed to re-record them, and because uh, sure. yeah. I don't think we'd ever recorded them in Glass Eye, and so and so about half the songs on Another Day in the Sun are Glass Eye songs by me that are have been re-recorded, and you can kind of tell which ones those are because Brian sings back up on them, uh, like right. Glass Eye did, and like, like Old Brother is one of them, Basement's one of them. Yeah, that's uh, uh, let's see, uh, <clears throat> One Chord is one of them, and so uh, kind of and then like and then the rest of them are ones that I wrote with my Dead Dog's Eyeball band that I went on dog's eyeball and they have you know a different person singing back up and uh and that's just i felt like whatever record i made <coughs> excuse me after dead dog's eyeball had to be as good so it took me a long time to make it mm. and i also didn't have any money so i had to like save up money from working in a restaurant to produce you know to record it and so it took a long time and by the time it came out nobody cared <laughs> but, uh, right. but it's still a really great record wrong. it stands I, up I to dead dog's eyeball it, it's a really great record I know a thing about putting out records uh, taking years and then, uh, yeah, just kind of gets out <laughs> it just took a long time. And I also, I also kind of uh, let myself down a little bit because I did not tour on it. And it surely would have gotten better known if I had toured on it, but I had, I just was so broke. And I also had a bad attitude about it. I felt like this, it's time for me to get fucking paid. Like I've paid the play yeah. for like 25, Thank 30 you. years Thank now. Thank you, yes. You know, yes. 
Like, I'm not going to go I'm out and lose another $10,000, you know, because I lost, when I went on my Dead Dog's Eyeball tour, I toured for an entire year, and at the end of the year, I'd lost $8,000, and I had to declare bankruptcy, and I got audited by the IRS, and I came out squeaky clean, because I really did lose $8,000, so, so, I, I mean, I, I kind of was feeling, like, you know, somewhat burnt with the whole, like, uh, you know, come on, it's about time for me to get, like, fucking paid already, and, uh, Jeans, and I'm not yeah. going to go in the hole more for this, you know? Sure. And, and so that probably was the wrong call <laughs> because, oh. uh, because it was followed by me not doing any music at all for like, you know, 10 more sure. years because, yeah. because, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't tour on it. And, uh, and also my husband, uh, I would recently gotten married and he was not crazy about uh, <clears throat> the finances involved in uh, <clears throat> me going on the road and uh, yeah. going to, going to debt for it. So, uh, yeah. anyway, uh, but yeah, but yeah thank you. I mean, Daniel, uh, one thing I say to people now, they're, I don't know, I don't really don't know how people react to this. I really don't know. But yeah. Daniel Johnson said that Glass Eye was the Beatles of Austin and I was the John Lennon of Austin, which is really <laughs> high praise. Okay. And I'm, I should, I have it in my press kit. Oh, yeah. I have He's it in my Beatles press kit because it yeah. came out in the paper. And, uh, and uh, so I'm a really, really good songwriter. I mean, I really am. I'm not just a sort of good. Yeah. I'm great. I'm a great songwriter. You are. And uh, and this is something that uh, I don't think is uh, generally thought about me, because uh, generally speaking, people think of me as the interpreter of Daniel Johnston. Yeah. So, no. Uh, no. You, so I know oh, the well, Glass Eye stuff is not streaming anywhere. Is that uh, none of it is? Oh, because when I uh, took back uh, when I took back Dead Dog's Eyeball from Barnon, I took all the Glass Eye stuff too. Okay. And so I own it. I own it all. And the main reason mm -hmm. it's not streaming is because uh, I want to sell people. I want them to buy it. Okay. Yeah. I want them to get it for fucking free. Fuck that yeah. shit. The only people who want it are the people from the olden days, like our age. They can buy it from you. Yeah. <laughs> That's my feeling. And I, uh, I, uh, may, I will make them a copy. Like, get in touch with me over my website. I'll make you a copy of a Glass Eye record. And uh, just recently, I put two of them up on on a Bandcamp because uh, uh, I think it's because you guys uh, was it you or somebody else? Somebody needed me to have something that was available, and so I I put a the two easiest to put on Bandcamp ones up. And so now those two are, are available streaming. Uh, okay. But, but and, and that's fine. I mean, uh, you know, I might've sold as many as, of those as I was likely to, unless I put yeah. them on vinyl yeah. again. It's kind of funny because I, uh, I had to take pictures of the covers to put them on Bandcamp and I got my vinyl out because they came out on vinyl. That's how fucking old they are, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it's like, they, and, and uh, you know, they're in pretty good shape. So that kind of looks new. It kind of looks like a new record that just came out because it's because it's vinyl like that, uh, yeah. and so I you know took pictures of it and, and put it up. But you know what? I don't. I don't. I'm not sure anybody's has a has bought any since I put them up, you know, last week or something. We'll see yeah. after the podcast well, comes out. Yeah. Well, we once yeah once once. This, well, it's uh, well it's on live right now, so we're on live. So I would you know probably around nine nine. 30 central time you're going to probably see a flood of orders coming in yeah right they'll just be awesome the show. So, well they're really they're All really good records <laughs> i had yeah, listened to them you know uh, when i was putting them up there and i was like man this is a great record is this songs on this record yeah, this is a really good song i still do that one <laughs> <laughs> well, everything sounds great on vinyl so there you go yeah. it's like i mean it's yeah, yeah no it's it, it definitely like oh well, I, 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 like, you guys have such a contemporary sound like like we do like uh, you know, like uh, it was just really ahead of its time for the '80s, but you know, it sounds very. It has kind of... aged well. It has yeah. aged well. Yeah. In the '80s, when we were playing, people were always like this. I really love Glass Eye, but I don't know how to describe it. I don't know how yeah. to describe the music to you. And and then one night, I mean, it was a while back, but there was a get together at a local, a bar, and uh, there was a radio show on, of uh, the m music from our scene was going to be played on the local radio. And so, and so a bunch of people that were involved in that scene were like, let's all party and we'll get drunk while we listen to ourselves on the radio. So uh, mm -hmm. we went down there to do that. And everyone was like this, you know, your stuff doesn't sound dated at all. And I was like, yeah, yeah. it really holds yeah. up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was true, like compared to the other bands that were part of our scene, um, our stuff uh, seems to be a timeless, you know, or at least it doesn't mm -hmm. sound dated, you know. You see it like as, a, a scene in the past or it seems like Austin kind of has the you know like you look at the 60s to the 70s to the 80s there's always kind of something you know something worth talking about going on there um, it's true it's true well like I said there's 
ton of young people here and it used to be cheap and there's a ton of creative people here so right. and yeah. they still are it just i don't know i don't i just personally as a as a, a middle-aged person i'm kind of like i have no idea where they're getting their money and i'm kind of afraid that the way that the arts are going to go in america now is only trust fund kids are going to be able to do it so it'll be kind of like the 19th century again you know where because during our my lifetime middle class kids or just poor people anybody could make music and yeah. uh, now it kind of seems like well it seems like the only people who are going to be able to uh not make any money <laughs> are going to be people who have money coming in already you know mm -hmm. i hope that isn't what happens but uh i mean it seems like the most logical place for it to go right it's depressing I sorry <laughs> it's depressing. oh no it's no, it, that no, it's it's that it's that uh comfortable pause yeah doesn't happen often in conversations but it's happening now so which that's a good thing. Um, well, you've got a song queued up. Did you want to play a song? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Let me just see what's going on here. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll definitely pr uh, put your website on there and, and any anything you want to. You're free to promote anything right now at the moment. So, so you can just I can. Oh, I've got all kinds of things <laughs> to talk about. So I can get the, the glass eyes stuff uh, just on. Is it kind of like an on demand thing then you, you do? Well, right now you can stream the two uh, on the record, the records uh, "Bent by Nature" and "Hello, Young Lovers," that were our biggest records. You can stream okay. those now on Bandcamp, and then the first two records, "Huge" and "Marlow," you can go, uh, through my website. You can, uh, which is uh, thekathymccarty dot com, you can buy a hand painted copy of it from me, and okay. they're twenty bucks, so it's not much. I mean, it's reasonable. And uh, and, and those uh, are CDs. Those are CDs. Yeah, and then okay. you can also buy the Dead Dog's Eyeball Collector's Edition, incredibly fancy, double gatefold, double album of Dead Dog's Eyeball on vinyl. That sounds amazing from my website. Or one of my uh, extremely comfortable 100% cotton t-shirts, which oh. are the kind of t-shirt worn by the Special Olympians because they're okay. very picky about how it feels. And I like my t-shirt to be very comfortable. So they're really nice and it has a, a very uh unknown a graphic of a daniel johnson art uh on it that the family was kind enough to let me use for free which was very nice of them so it's got a daniel uh drawing on it, it seems that, like it that's young, appropriate youth really really are responding to his art where you know uh angel and i have a friend who's who's a whose son is like you know really kind of taken with a lot of the artwork and the artwork's amazing. He's yeah, yeah. Really so it seems like his his artwork is kind of going on. Um, you, you know, well, there's in, there's in, more of it. it you know, surprisingly, yeah. there's more there's more artwork than music, and there's a, thousands of songs, but there's tens yeah. of thousands of drawings. So, so and but they just had a big uh, retrospective of his visual artwork here in town, and it was oh, an wow. incredible show, and it was very moving. <laughs> and they'd hoped to send that show around the country. To various different museums but uh that didn't happen for some reason they, they weren't oh, able to get bad. any traction with it it's a really beautiful show i mean they told us they have a, a, some drawings and uh various things that uh, that i own in it and so when they when they used it for the exhibit um it was kind of like we're not sure when that you're gonna get these back and i was like that's okay i mean just whenever you know wasn't planning on selling them or anything and uh, uh oh my back my, my computer's running out of juice here i am going oh, yeah. to have to get a charger uh and uh, I'll do that in a minute. Um, here, let me stand up. But um, anyway, it didn't go anywhere. But but he did get a, a show at the, uh, what was it? That's a really famous museum that's in New York. Uh, the Whitney. The Whitney, yeah. yeah. He, had a, he, got, he got a show at the Whitney. So that, oh, wow. you know, that's wow. really great, right? It wasn't the that's same show as here yeah. in Austin, but it was a, it was a show. And, uh, and I'm sure there are lots of visual artists who probably felt really mad about it because I think I, I you know, think I just bought the dead dog, uh, <laughs> dead dog Aya artwork back there. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the original painting of the cover. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I have so, all my I have all my album cover paintings. I mean, I, people have wanted to buy them, but I uh, I never. So saw I don't them. know if you're aware. When I was in there, I, someone uh, wanted the to buy the cover of Another Day in the Sun, and uh, I said no. <laughs> But I said I would uh, I'd copy it for them. And I'm working on that right now. It's almost finished. But I can't show it to you because uh, I can't show it to you because I just left that room. <laughs> and it's in there. 
Well, cool. Anyway, well, now, now I'm, I'm hooked up to the juice again, so I don't have to worry about my computer dying. So you asked me about what I'm doing now. Well, I do have some things to talk about. I have just made the most incredible record I've ever made in my life. And, yeah. Uh, just, what's the name of it again? I, the, name of, the name of it is apotheosis. apotheosis. And that is a word that means turning into a god. Mm. And uh, that's the name of my of my uh, of my album. And it, the, re the way it came about is I wrote a song about George Washington because I think he's a very troubling and enigmatic figure because he does not seem to be entirely human to me. And I was thinking about this, so I wrote a song about it. And uh, and I was talking about the song to someone like, well, I just wrote a song about George Washington. I know it's kind of a square thing to write a song about, but uh, he's a troubling figure in a way. And uh, and I said, he doesn't seem entirely human. And they said, you know, there's a really famous statue in, in D.C. called The Apotheosis of George Washington. And it depicts him turning into a god. And I went, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. So the name of that right. song is The Apotheosis of George Washington. And then I just kind of fell in love with the whole idea of apotheosis. And then, uh, and then I, I made this record. And uh, all my stuff is good. I've never released a bad song. I mean, but they're not yeah. that accessible necessarily. Uh, usually you have to listen to my stuff a, little, a few times before you start liking it. And, yeah. uh, and then all of a sudden I started writing stuff that was really good, but was also access accessible. I don't know why this didn't happen in my twenties. That would have been helpful. But, uh, but I started doing it in my, uh, in my later, in my, uh, middle age. And, uh, and after a while I couldn't believe how many hits I was writing. And I was like, sure. I would take my these songs to, to Brian. I'd be like, I think I wrote another hit song and I'd play it for him and he'd go like, I don't even want to produce it. It's, I don't know what to do with hit songs like this. I'm not used to producing <laughs> hit songs. <laughs> and no, so, uh, I, so this record well, is, is going to be like phenomenally amazing. I mean, if, if nothing else, I expect every single employed rock critic or, or former rock critic in America to go, it's a revelation. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to be doing a Kickstarter for that, for the uh, pressing and stuff uh, shortly. Nice. I'm working on it right now. All right. Cool. And, uh, and uh, I'm also the kind of person that everyone's been telling me forever, like, you're the kind of person that should have a Patreon. And I'm like, okay. Okay, I'll make one. So I, I'm going to make a Patreon, too, for those who want to give me $5 a month to continue to make art. And uh, yeah. I know a lot of people who do fine with that, which I always say it seems to me kind of like paying for nothing. Like, I would be doing this anyway, so why should they give me any money? But then I thought, oh, I can give them shit that they, couldn't, they wouldn't get otherwise. Because I, I am very productive, so... I can, uh, yeah. I can, I can, uh, I can make it worth their while. I can make it worth it, and uh, and so doing that. And then I also, uh, you know, I started a uh, painting. I mean, I've always been a painter. That's why I always my own album covers. But um, I'm a self-taught painter, uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't. I used to be able to say I never had even one single art lesson, but actually I've had one now. So, so I've had mm. one. But uh, mm. but people, uh, I decided. Uh, I guess maybe about seven years ago, I thought, um, you know, if I uh, actually work at this, I might actually be good. <laughs> actually like was serious about it for 10 seconds instead of just using it as an amusement for myself and uh, so i thought well I'll try to be good now and i almost immediately got really good and uh if anything i'd make more money selling paintings than doing anything else because people will still pay for that they'll still pay for a painting yeah an original no, I, painting. yeah i saw you were uh yeah because i was kind of just scrolling through you know anything i could find on facebook and yeah you, you were like like sold out paintings here and there i'm like holy cow yeah you go. yeah I, i'm the best-selling uh I'm the best-selling artist at the gallery that I show in, and uh, that will end soon, though, because they're going to do a Daniel Johnston show in January. Oh, <laughs> and then he then it'll be him. But right now, I'm I'm number one, and uh, and uh, let's see what else what else am I doing? Um, I also uh, recently um, was asked to be part of a all-star punk rock band to mm. honor a friend of ours named Pat Blaschel, who uh, is a photojournalist and. Uh, and uh, I got to play with um, some real luminaries. Uh, I got to play with Chris Gates from Junkyard and the Big Boys. And, okay. uh, and Pat from The Offenders. And uh, Steve okay. Collier from Doctor's Mob. And Dottie Farrell from The Punkaroos and me. Okay. I felt really lucky to be included because I did play something, music that was a little bit more punk rock in my very early youth. But not, I'm not really famous for being a punk rocker. Uh, so it was nice yeah. of them to have me be part of this punk rock band. And it was so fun yeah. that I decided was, to put uh, together a punk was, rock band. Hmm? What was the first punk band that you that what? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you, you know, yeah, because my, my very first my very first band was a band was? called us uh, Sinequan, and uh, okay. and we were not famous at all, and and everything I wrote for that band was terrible, uh, unbelievably <laughs> shitty, uh, but the other guy that wrote for for the band was good, 
and uh, and we weren't that bad. We were very short lived, and uh, and then after that, I was in a band that was famous in Austin called the Buffalo Gals. That was an all girl punk rock band, I've and uh, and uh, and uh, people liked us. Yeah. We were popular. Well, well, and, but uh, what was the first like punk rock thing or music that you heard in Texas? Uh, when moment? I met Brian, when I met Brian, he was really into punk rock, and we were seventeen. Yeah. And uh, he lived in Connecticut and I lived here, but um, my family lived in the town that he lived in. And that's how I met him because I was visiting my grandmother or something. And, uh, and he really loved the Ramones. So the very first punk rock that I heard was American. It was the, the Ramones. And uh, later on, I heard the Sex Pistols and, and they kind of got some traction and, and imitators here in Austin. And I always thought that was really stupid because uh, it just seems so copycat and to be, try and be like the British punks, you know. Oh, like to spitting me. and all that. Yeah. Spitting and safety pins and wearing black leather and stuff. It's sure. like, you know, it's 105 degrees here. You can't wear a black leather. <laughs> yeah. Stupid. Stupid. Yeah. I mean, it's not yeah, more normal for it to be like scratch acid and just take all your clothes off because it's 105 <laughs> degrees, you know? Like, just be That's naked. Normal. Being naked, it makes more sense here. And, no, uh, I- well, earlier yeah. before before you came on, we we were playing. Uh, I played the uh, Woods uh, the Woodshock uh, documentary that, or the, yeah. the movie. Yeah, and. And I was just, so Brian is, is blind. So I was describing like everything that uh-huh. I was seeing. And, and all these people are naked. <laughs> yeah, most of them are half, half naked. naked. There's the guy looking for uh, looking for a pipe to smoke weed out of. There's the, you mm-hmm. know, and it, it's like, and that's for, you know, for me, that just, I guess, is burned in my brain as far as what Austin, mm-hmm. or at least, at least the. Uh, I it guess was a very Austin awesome event. Very Austin awesome sure. event. And uh, anyway, so I'm putting together a punk rock band currently as a side project and it's going to be all ladies and we're going to express all the rage that we feel that our culture silences so it's going to be epic oh. absolutely epic and i've written a bunch of music for it already and people are very excited about it uh and, and uh, when is that going to so happen that well right now i'm writing the songs and okay. uh and then the concept is that we will get together because uh, a few of the ladies in the band are from out of town they're luminaries from out of town so mm-hmm. we will uh we will rehearse and learn the songs and then we'll probably play. And then at some point after that, we will record our, the best six and, uh, and then uh, put them out. But um, it's a keenly anticipated project and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And the name of this band I should mention is going to be Boner Killer. That's the name of our band. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm actually getting excited just from you. You're like getting a boner. You're getting me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's going to be really mine great. right now. It's I'm actually excited. And hopefully if we uh, have a few hundred bucks burning in our pockets, we'll try to come down there and, and, uh, well, I, I have had out. women come over to me. I, I, sometimes I talk on stage when I'm uh, playing and I'll, and I'll say, I'll talk about boner killer for a minute and I'll say, you know, uh, what I'm envisioning is a, a mosh pit full of middle-aged women moshing, moshing and thrashing. And, uh, yeah. I think listen, that, I think and because I, I think that uh, this is a this is a something that culture has not been addressed is the rage of middle aged women. And I think that uh, that's our target audience. And one thing I discovered after I thought of it is that this is the largest demographic on Earth. I'm going to clean up like you're not going to believe, yeah, you know, I think you're, and, uh, and I'll have women say. come over to me afterward and press twenty dollar bills into my hand saying, I need boner killer in my life. Yeah. <laughs> Make it happen. Make it happen, and I'm kind of like, yeah, I think wow. you need to, yeah, I, would just, yeah. I think it should just party. be a brand. Like, I, I mean, I could see like boner killer t shirts just yeah. sell. Oh, just yeah, put, we gotta, we gotta get, we have, I've gotta get on the t shirt design immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah t shirts. You're reminding are, us, yeah, no, yeah. you reminded us about t shirts as well. We need our own merch, and yeah, mm-hmm. you know, but bring yeah, some of that glass I, eye, uh, you know, some of that. Uh, I'm, I'm working on the apotheosis t shirt at the moment, oh. by which I mean, I'm having somebody do it for me, uh, who I think is the correct artist to uh, uh, capture the apotheosis thing and you know the apotheosis record is like you know really the main thing that uh, i'm going to be uh doing next but uh in the time that i'm waiting until i can actually get it pressed i'm not sure what the wait for vinyl is right now but it was 18 months before i I think it's still probably pretty backed up so while i'm waiting for that to be pressed i will be uh doing all the uh boner killer stuff you know and of course, the Boner Killer record, you know, won't come out until after that. But at least we'll be playing live a couple times, you know. I think you, I think you should just get like by the time the record, you should get the the brand the merch out so much that by the time the record comes out, people are just shocked, like, oh, Boner Killer is a band. Like, <laughs> like, maybe so, maybe so. The name everywhere, you know, yeah. like yeah. I, well, you know that this uh, a this million photo- dollar concept here. This this uh, photojournalist that we were honoring. 
at, at this uh, all-star show uh, posts on Facebook. His name is Pat Blaschel. And, uh, and he lives in Austria now, but, um, but he's, you know, he was in Austin for decades. And uh, anyway, he was putting up, showing all these posters. He was uh, showcasing a lot of poster art from Austin on his Facebook. And what he showed was that Scratch Acid put up posters with their name on it for like six months before they played their first gig. So that by the time they played their first gig, everyone had heard of them. Oh, wow. And I thought, wow, we never thought of that. That's such brilliant marketing. So I'm planning to poster the shit out of this town with boner killer posters way before we ever play. Well, even yeah. being from Chicago, I think people know the Jesus Lizard. Like, people who aren't music people know the Jesus Lizard more by t-shirts probably. The, by probably so. The yeah. images. They use the Hollywood a lot, too. You know, there's movies and stuff. The Jesus Lizard yeah. t-shirt. Uh, I know that, that might be... Well, just because they're cool, isn't it? I mean, I think that's the real reason is that they're a cool band. Uh, I know David Yell lives out there, and he's a actor now, and uh, right, yeah, he's been in a lot of movies and stuff. But I don't think people are wearing Jesus Lizard shirts in movies because of that. I mean, I think they're probably doing it because of the costume person. What we were trying to yeah. communicate: this is a cool person, so put a slap a Jesus Lizard it T-shirt was, on him. It was like the 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 Jesus Lizard were like the cool band that the cool bands listen to, like. Like you know, like you'd have to be really cool to know them to like. Really, I mean, I think I think of them as being pretty famous, like nationally. Yeah. Oh, I mean, they're famous now, yeah. But yeah, you know, yeah, they're, they were on a major American. label and stuff, I think. Uh, I, mean, I believe. Yeah, by the end they were on yeah. the capital. Yeah. At the end, I mean, but you know, a lot of my friends who got on major labels, by the time it happened, it was not really well timed for them. I mean, the sure. Reverse got a major label deal, uh, the Buttholes got a major label deal, and even though they were living in Chicago and stuff, but you know, the Jesus lizard did too, but uh, you know, for the most part, it didn't do what, what, what it might've done if it had happened earlier, you know, yeah. them yeah. getting that kind yeah, of like the best, the best, but the, or the best homes, Jesus lizard yeah. albums are not, you know, the, the two that aren't capital uh, and they're not bad records by any means, well, but they're just, you know, it's not the, the chaos isn't there like you want. Sure. With yeah. Uh, well, and in, in Mac, they're either. I think there's something. Yeah, I, I don't want to. Yeah. I, I know we're 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 going a little over, but. Oh, are we? Here. I'm sorry about that. No, no, that's no, fine. Do you have a do you have a butthole surfers story that nobody ever knows? Because I'm a huge butthole surfers fan, and. I well, know. I just known those guys since they formed. Uh, oh, one of the things I haven't mentioned is that I've written an entire book. Uh, oh yes, memoir. yes. The memoir of my uh, days in the punk scene, but it's not coming out at a date that I could tell you or anything. Okay. I'm still uh, rewriting it. Uh, I wrote I wrote it one time, and, I, and some beta, some people who read my manuscript said that it was uh, that it was full of trauma, and I was like, "What? I mean, it's just a story of my life. I didn't think it was particularly traumatic." And then I thought, "Well, I need to make it funnier because that's what I like in a book. I like it books when they're funny. Sure, it does have a lot of humor in it. I mean, just like you know, the humor of life, you know, but." Uh, I'm going back over it one more time to be like, let's make it funnier, put more funny stuff in. But there's a big story about the butthole surfers in there. Uh, but it's kind of long. Okay. And I would tell you now, but I mean, how much time have I got? Hmm. Let me think. Is Pat here yet? Or? He's here. Yeah. Did, yeah. Did, can we bring him on and see if does he mind? Who he yeah. Is? Do you mind if our friend Pat jump, jumps Pat, in? Pat Daly? No, no, right. it's fine. If there's a butthole surfer story, uh, by all means, we're going to make time for it. And um, okay. yes, please. So, okay, so this ba this band that I was in called the the Buffalo Gals, we were famous and we had a big we had a big big draw, and and uh, we kind of sucked, but I'd I'd started writing good songs by then, so we had so we had some good songs, and uh, anyway we we were breaking up, and so we booked our final show at this club that was the premier punk club in town, called Club Foot, mm. and after after we had booked it, uh, Jamie our drummer was briefly dating Paul Leary, and she said, can the this new, Paul has a new band. Is there, you know, they're just forming. Uh, can they be on the gig? And I said, sure. I kind of like those guys. They, they seem like nice guys. So we added them as to be openers for us. And so the night of the gig approached, and we got down to the club, and my mother, who had never come to see my band ever, came for the first and last time to see the Buffalo Gals. My mom was there, like an uncool, you know, kind of uncool person, you know, as far as that goes. But I mean, I love my mom, so I, mean, I was going to hang out with her, you know. Cool. My final show and uh anyway so i go backstage because this place was so fancy it actually had a green room right 
And uh, I was back there and I was having a beer and uh, Gibby came in and he started hassling me and saying that he should headline the show and the butthole should headline the show because because uh, their star was rising and, and that we should play the middle slot. And I said, mm-hmm. are you joking? <laughs> it's just a, right. are, you, are you being funny? Because uh, all the posters say we're headlining. So everyone who's coming down here to see us for the last time is going to show up at midnight. So why would we play before that? And then they would get here and like we had already played. It doesn't make any sense. I just blew him off. Like, that doesn't even make any sense, Gibby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stupid. Yeah, fuck off. Everyone knows, everyone knows the order of the bands. Like, you know, it's been publicized forever. Mm-hmm. But he wouldn't shut up. And he just kept on arguing with me and arguing with me and arguing with me for like a whole, the whole opening band. And so, and I was like, no, 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 no. And then uh, I said, look, my mom, my mom is here and she's waiting for me out there. And like, I would much, you know, I need to, to shut this down. We're done talking about this, Gibby. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, uh, well, just agree. And then, uh, and then you can go join your mom. I'm like, don't use my love for my mother against me to try and win this argument. The answer is no. And then, <laughs> and then Paul Leary came over, tapped him out and they started tag teaming me. Like Gibby had worn himself out trying to convince me and I was standing firm. And so now Paul was going to do it. And I realized what they were doing. And unfortunately, Paul looks a lot like my brother, who I have a very uh, problematic relationship with. Mm. But Paul, you can tell by looking at my face that I look a little bit like Paul Leary, right? So Paul looks a little like my, my, my brother, right? I thought you were going to say tender so, feelings, but... <laughs> no, no, no. He just looks kind of like my brother, who uh, like I you know, was antagonistic relationship with. Uh, he was uh, my enemy. And so, <laughs> and, so, uh, and so I'm looking at Paul, and I just suddenly it just snapped. And I jumped up, and I weighed like 90 pounds, right? I jumped up, I launched myself over the table, and I cold cocked him right across the jaw. And while my fist was connecting with Paul Leary's face, I thought, this is the best way to resolve disputes ever. Why didn't I think this an hour ago? Jesus Christ, this feels so fucking good. <laughs> Just sock, socking him, you know? And then his hand, he, he says that he didn't hit me back, but I remember he did. Just automatically came up and like, Bam! Hit me on the ear. It oh. hurt so bad, and I thought that previous thought was remarkably mistaken. <laughs> this is not the best way for little girls to solve arguments with men oh, by trying wow. to get it, getting into fisticuffs because I'm going to lose always, like I did with my brother, right? Wow. And so after that, I didn't really remember that much about the <laughs> night because I was in a ton of pain. But I won, and we headlined, and they there lost. There we go. And, uh, Great story. The Buffalo, the Buffalo Gals uh, headlined that night. And later on, Paul Leary became a big fan of my music, and he apologized profusely for being dicks. And, I, and uh, he said that they were not necessarily in their right minds that night. Mm. Mm. Or, or any yeah. night. Right. Well, so I mean, in terms he, of what was in their bodies that they might have ingested. Right, right. Is what I'm yeah. talking about. So Feel anyway, so then okay. we all became good friends, and it was fine. Kathy McCarty, I need to steer you to a story by a guy named Kramer, who I don't oh, know. I know Kramer. I know yeah. Kramer. Oh, so oh, Kramer about- went, uh, went toured yeah. Europe with them, and and he wrote like you know there was like some sort of uh, you know request like tell three stories, and one of them was the most epic butthole surfer story about touring <laughs> Europe, and everything you know about these guys times a thousand is in that story. It's incredible. Well, well, Teresa was my roommate for a while, so and she's great. I love Teresa. And, How's she uh, doing? I've I've heard she's, uh, she's on the way out. Uh, yeah, that's unfortunately. It, yeah. Uh, and I mean, I I've been trying to go see her for a couple of years now, but I think she just doesn't want anybody to visit. Uh, sure. And uh, and then you know, for what I read a post that made it sound like she was like gonna die that day or something, and but then she came on Facebook later and said that you know she was holding steady. So so maybe yeah. it'll be a while more, but I mean she's she's definitely you know not in the great not not in a not going to recover let's put it that way she's not going to recover well, sure she's definitely one of my drumming inspirations not, oh, her she's and Karen yeah absolutely fabulous you know yeah it's it's a weird being a punk rocker because so, so many of people in our age group who were part of our scenes are not around and tend to die early you know for various reasons you know and uh and so I feel in some ways like we're living what people maybe 10 or 20 years older than us would normally live, where so many of our compatriots are dropping, you know, right. and, 
and it's it, and it's still really er, a little early for that to be happening you know at least to the extent that it seems to be happening sure. okay well i guess you you have someone else lined up and so i should get lost oh it's no all, I mean, it's all you're welcome to stick around yeah yeah it's, i mean it's, it's, all, it's all irish time. irish guest night here on the oh, yeah. great. this is like the tonight show here so no it's like uh, a tonight show so well, this, in that case, is... I mean, I think I will go make myself a cocktail, and I go. will rejoin you. Now you're... And I'll just, just listen. I'll, the Irish I'll try not to. Uh, to keep <laughs> I have a tendency no, to gas on. Uh, it's, uh, you're a gone gas girl. That's fine. That's the not Irish too. We talk too Irish much. Thing. We drink it's too much. Thing. That's right. I talk too much, and then I have this. Do you have this Irish thing? I have this thing. I have one drink and I think, man, I feel better. Another one will make me feel even better. Absolutely. And I keep thinking that over and over again until I'm losing uh, myself. There's a, yeah, there's a diminishing returns at, at some there's point. There's a certain point where you should say, I've had four, it's enough. But that, that seems to somehow just not really compute with my uh, Irish mind. A few years then, from now, I will get there. But I, I won't even tell you the story about my 90-year-old uncle who, eat, who drinks you know, 90 Rob Roy's every night and is doing great. Well, I don't drink every day, but when I do, I, I seem to have this switch that doesn't work where I should realize that, like, this is the time to stop drinking if you want to drive home without getting arrested, you know? Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't have, work. Although yeah, I don't I actually, drive home. You got to get that looked at. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, so I, I actually, I don't drink anymore as it was well, over six years at this point, so, which is, okay. Well, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm totally cool. It's probably cool. just something you remember. <laughs> well, I'm going to make a drink, and uh, and oh, I'm yeah, going enjoy. to come back, and, I, and then I'm going to yeah. smoke a cigarette because I'm completely depraved. There you go. So, Carol. Brian, you want to you want to uh, introduce our next? Uh, this is a, so yeah, this is a Pat Daly, um, legendary. The Pat Daly. The Pat Daly, uh, uh, record store, uh, um, uh, owner, and uh, Empire Records. Uh, with a rack and tour, I think is is the yes the the phrase uh, that, that could come in handy here. Uh, like Kathy, I have a tendency to gas on if that's what you're getting at. That's it, true. It, you're gone gasser too. Yeah. May or may not own uh, a venue that, or not a venue. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know venue. what you're talking about. There's no venues. What venue? <laughs> Angel, yeah. have you been to the venue which shall not be named? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. No, but I've I don't, I don't, <laughs> yes, no, no. never been nor stepped into such venue. So, um, it's but it's I, I've I've heard uh, yeah, there's been some yeah. whispers that there there has been a certain venue that does hold certain shows. John, that, John we'll have to fix that someday. Has been on yes. our show as as yes. well as playing at the, the place that may or may not exist yeah <laughs> but yeah um so and yeah the, and obviously brian's been wanting to have you on uh because of uh you know you're as just as knowledgeable about music as as we are maybe maybe a few up teens who you know yeah yeah, just, yeah i think you know what brian left out of the intro is that i'm just a natural contrarian and so you know our discussions yeah. go on and on and on, and he's typically wrong, but it takes a long time okay. for me to get that across to him. We're not going to be able to talk about Moby Grape. We're going to have to... <laughs> oh, not a fan of the grape? Take the grape off the table. Well, I've, got, I've got thoughts about Moby Grape. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's, it, for me, there's like maybe three or four core songs that I can really get into, and then the rest is just like, eh. Yeah, but I, Angel, I challenge you to listen to those four core songs because they are so dumb. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I love they, dumb. I, I love dumb. That's where I go. I'm like, okay, I, I you know, I, I want to, you know, Moby Grape. All my most trusted people love Moby Grape. I'm gonna like dive into the Moby Grape songs, and the more I listen, the more I hate them. So Brian <laughs> is in the brunt of the. I just always am like is you know the king of moby grape and i just come at him you know like you know yeah. post you know three feet long <laughs> grape <laughs> oh my god i yeah um so yeah pat is a a, a, a critic of the grape and uh, yeah well we were, we were we're gonna have you on to talk about the last waltz because um it's yeah it's coming on last waltz season and also today is it is his birthday uh Step which, on for a second. Which is some kismet that I had. Yeah, not. it's whose birthday? 
Martin, it's Martin Scorsese's it's birthday. Smarty's right? birthday. He's 80. Oh, happy 80 birthday, days. Martin Scorsese. Nice. Yeah. So if, if you follow us on our Facebook page, you there's a question about your favorite Martin Scorsese film. Yeah. Which, I don't which, follow which, you on your Facebook page. I got to fix that. That's this. What, oh, so yeah, we'll find you. We'll find you. Brian want, and do a show? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, let's make a show. Let's well, make a show. Yeah. Here you uh, what's your favorite? What's your favorite, uh, Pat? What? Uh, so, Pat's. I'm gonna just spoiler alert. I do. I don't think it's the last waltz. I don't have a favorite Martin Scorsese movie. Did he do uh, The Godfather? I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, he's he's going heavy contrarian. That's a uh, wow. You you don't have a not um. Not Goodfellas or? Uh, no, no, you know, I, I watch him, you know, he puts in the Layla song, yeah. He's great. Yeah. And I'm just not a big film buff, you know. Oh, yeah, really? I, um, I got my favorites, but they're not, you know. Like, what is your guy. favorite movie, Pat? That's like, uh, if, if you, were... you know, I'm a big fan of Diner. I love Diner so much. Watch that over and over. It's a it's a weird film. I I I have to revisit that one again. There's that scene where the forget who the actor is, but he's like freaking out that his girlfriend is messing around with his record collection. Yeah, I just know that is the the classic record geek moment. But you know, until Kevin Bacon has replaced the baby Jesus in the manger scene, I mean, you know. Oh right. No one has lived. That's one of the greatest cinemas of all time. No, man, I can get down with Diner. No, my favorite Scorsese would be uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Great oh, soundtrack. Yeah. Ellen Burstyn. Chris Christopherson. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's shit, a good kicking, one. shit kicking, shit kicking, shit <laughs> kicking. <laughs> Kathy, do you have a favorite Scorsese film? It is well, his birthday. Did, did somebody mention Goodfellas? Yeah. Yeah. I so did. We, that movie is really good. I'm sorry. That's a really great movie. Mm-hmm. That's a, yeah, Pat didn't like it. He's, our, he's a contrarian. I, he's really good. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I, that's I, a, I, I, I liked it. I liked it. It and, is and amazing. What about, what, what about Casino? Did he make that one? Yeah. Yes. Well, that's where Layla good. shows up. And I get those confused. That one's, a, oh. that one's really amazing, too. I mean, you can watch that one on so many different levels. Like one, If you watch it just as a, somebody who's like appreciating good acting, the acting in Casino is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Everybody, everybody is so fucking great in it, you know. And of course, yeah. the part where they're uh, kicking the guy to death in the desert this is a classic moment. It's oh, a classic yeah. film moment there. Yeah, there's there's also this uh, my favorite. Those, are, no, those, those were some Chicago boys that were being kicked to. Uh, oh, in death, the sticks. Yeah, uh, right I've, got a, I've got a, a story about that. Um, uh, I was out for like Dad's night, you know, at my kid's school, and um, you know. Smolensky was there and Eagle was there and the guys were there and then some guy named Spilatro was there, you know, invited. And um, so I'm like, oh my God, Spilatro. And so I get to the event. I'm like, Spilatro, how's that last name working out for you? Ha ha. Turns out he is totally a Chicago casino Spilatro. I'm like, oh shit. I just thought he had an unfortunate last name. He's the, I, oh man. And I'm just crawling. Yeah, no, I, well, Kathy, where where we're at, there's definitely a lot of crazy mob stories, and I mean, yeah, we don't, anything- we don't have that there, that here. Uh, we don't really have the mob here, so I grew up without the mob. But we have yeah. this thing that is uh, the Good Old Boy Network, which is just bad, different it's mob, a yeah, bunch of, yeah, bunch of uh, you know, horrible, you know, the people that are in the state house right now that just got reelected. They're a bunch, yeah. of, a bunch of total criminals. Could we, no doubt. Could, has anyone ever suggested airlift? Could we airlift Austin out of Texas? Like, is that I wish that be considered? Yeah. I mean, the thing that kills me is there's more of us than there are them. Just more of us don't vote, and uh, or yeah. have our their votes suppressed. You know, I mean, it's so hard. Texas is like a third world country. It's so hard to vote. People from other countries are like, what now? You know, like you have, you don't have any mail-in voting. Why don't you just go to mail-in voting? Because they don't want us to vote. That's why. That's why we don't have mail-in right. voting. You know? It's just, it's like you, you can, you can use a, your uh, gun registration card to prove who you are to vote, but you can't use your student ID. Yeah. And there's no polling places on any campus. 
in the state because they don't want the young people to vote. Right. And so, you know, it's just, it's fucked up. Yeah. It's just. A, well, now, that? now there's talk oh, yeah. that they want to uh, put, put the, uh, that, you know, that because the, the, the for, in this election, the youth vote was actually pretty, uh, 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 you know, seismic, not seismic, but bigger than it has been. Now they want to figure out how to get the voting age back up to, to 21. Oh, man. Where will it end, Brian? But anyway, one day in 1976, blah, 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 some old white dudes threw a concert. What do you got going on here, Brian? What are we talking well, we about? Got, we, we're, Pat is here to talk about the last waltz. We are in last waltz season. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so I'll get right into it. You know, it is because it, it's all about the season, you know, and, um, you know, disclaimer, I love the band. I love uh, so many of their songs. I'm not a band hater. And I'm always like, well, I love their records, man. I bet the live records are even better. And, you know, a lot of times that's the case. There's all these great live albums over the years that we could point to and just say that really captures the band better than their studio records. But for some reason, with the band, I, you know, I don't love The Last Waltz that much. And we'll talk about that. Don't love like Rock of Ages. I'm like, oh, it's going to be unbelievable. They're in New Orleans. There's horns. It's going to be fantastic. And it always falls flat to me. I don't know why. But to the, to the, to the, point, to the point of the season, to the point of the season, I blame the lackluster, slow-mo, you know, lifelessness i know you're all gonna kill me of the last waltz because everyone's whacked out on tryptophan you know that they've had mm. the turkey and somehow influence i never thought of their 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 ability to like play the songs at the correct tempo <laughs> I never thought of it. well okay let's break it down then i think okay. he may be right you know, I'm so you have a good point. I mean, go back to it. I mean, you have a good point. So what's the first song? They get it's um. How does it start, Brian? Help me out. Is it uh, up on Cripple Creek? Just yeah. and I, I really almost looked it up. Like, the movie is it like six times time. longer than the, the than the than the album version? Because they're going so slow. <laughs> the, singing is, the singing is incredible, but the but man, the band is like bum 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 bum. That's which, how I. Which feel. Is, which is really on with the cocaine they were doing. An excellent point. Acceptable. What, it, what should, it, it should have offset. It, it it makes you concerned about with the amount of cocaine that was going around there. Right. It makes you concerned about the effects of tryptophan. You got to say like if Facts. if tryptophan can't beat cocaine. Yeah. So and let's break know, it down. I mean, okay. And I was going to add it. this into it. Just yeah. one week ago. A buddy posted uh, something. It's, it's actually in Wikipedia. It says common misconceptions. And it's like, you know, a hundred things like, you know, a cat doesn't have nine lives. I'm like, what? You know, it's got. And um, one of them is tryptophan doesn't make you drowsy. So that like blows up my whole, you know, thesis. So we're kind <laughs> of at, at a logger's head here about how to deal with what the hell is wrong with the last waltz. Well, let's. I, I, I still I still concur with the tryptophan, tryptophan theory myself. Okay. I I I get it. Just because Wikipedia matter. says it doesn't make you drowsy. I'm with you, Kathy. Absolutely. I it mean, makes me drowsy for sure. Point, does it matter that, not to sound like a, a, a right winger, but <laughs> you know, at, at this point, I think so many people believe that tryptophan causes them to be drowsy that it will have a psychosomatic approach, like yes. effect on them. Yes. Just like a sugar pill. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the other thing, because, because you know, right, I'm with you, Brian, because, and I don't even know if it's, you know, psychosomatic. Um, you got the band, I'm, I, I assume they had like a turkey dinner before they took the stage, because, you know, Bill Graham. They served, uh, they served a, a big turkey dinner to everybody. To, to everybody yeah, the show. yeah, but then they, then they served it to the fans. Right. Yeah. So the fans, yeah. that was a really excellent eight minute version of up on cripple creek they're barely conscious <laughs> and then it, it, everything changes you know not, not to rush to the punchline but then van morrison comes on packed into that little brown sausage jumpsuit and lights <laughs> the whole universe on fire and saves the day 
his van. <laughs> not even well, politics, notwithstanding. And how that that's that was a four hour show, right? They they played six, right? Or something. So so I want. I, so I, go, I would like to, to throw in something here. Yeah. Sure. As a performing musician, one thing that you often think, especially if you're recording it and you're thinking of making an album of a show, is that you talk to each other beforehand. You go, let's not rush because we're going to be so excited that we're going to rush the songs and play them too fast. Right. So that That's might an be interesting important. point. Part yeah. of what might have been going on with the band is that they were like, okay, we're recording yeah, this for now. Yeah. Let's like really watch our tests. Make sure we don't get so excited that we that we rush through the set. Just right. just oh, recently, oh, as in it. like just yesterday, I was listening to um, um, "Stop Making Sense," and that's my view of that one: is that they are so hot and so on fire, and they are rushing the tempos because they're like, so yeah. excited because they're making a Jonathan Demi movie. Right. Uh, you know, that's a theory. So yeah, that's well, a great. Well, I mean, point. it's kind of true because it is something that you think about before you take the stage. And if you're not drunk when you take the stage, you're going to be especially speedy because you're all excited and there's nothing bringing you back down. You know? There is no way the Talking Heads had a turkey dinner before Stop Making Sense. No, I mean, no. That, if you're not. all fucked up, too, that's the other thing. They're, they were definitely not eating turkey. <laughs> but, well, yeah. You know, I mean, and, and it's interesting, the, the, the stories behind what was going on, especially the uh, just like all the coke that was floating around the backstage, the... The, the tape loop of uh, sniffing. I mean, just the decadence of it. And, and then, um, so yeah, so you. They, so they yeah, might have we, even been doing speed balls, you know, to make sure, like making sure that they were mixing their drugs so that they would well, be normal. And then they ended up being slow, you know. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. The, the, the well, story, we, in my band, Kathy, I don't know if you know it, that, that, that uh, there was actually a cocaine room backstage so else have you heard that there was like a big spoon no, hanging you know i believe like, it I believe like like it. like um 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 it was a big art project by bill graham and then famously neil young has to be cut out of one of his scenes because he's got a like a little giant yeah, cocaine they're, they're, they're booger they're swinging they're at Russia. You know, for the but, for a large period of the shot my roommate said uh we were talking about that scene and he's like oh yeah it looks like neil is trying to eat his face because <laughs> he's just i mean <laughs> I did. My, I wanted to start a punk band recently, or uh, within the past couple of years. I think it was going to be called Neil Young's Coke Booger. I, I recall. Oh, <laughs> that's a good T-shirt. I gotta it's, believe. It's not. It's not know, bad. With the right graphics. I, I, I don't think it's. It's no. It's definitely not. It's not on a level with Boner Killer, but it's 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 no. got potential. Yes. Hey, I just I just want to throw this out here in case you're thinking about starting a punk band, but I was a. Uh, posting about boner killer earlier and somebody said i would like to see a boner killer show with the opening band unspeakable filth and i went you know what unspeakable filth has not been used so if any of you need a name for your punk band <laughs> unspeakable, unspeakable filth well, is actually, available i actually okay. have have as a i've had this vision of doing an all blind person hardcore band and our name would be white cane enema oh okay that's good that's good too yeah yeah so we, but it's i i i'm so but, you know what? Just white cane. Three more. White cane alone would be good because it almost sounds like cocaine, like white cane. Yeah. But it, but just plain white cane. I would go with just plain. Leave the enema part off and just have it be white cane. And oh. then you know, me, boner killer can uh, you know play with you in Chicago when, when we come through. You know. Yeah. No, we. we... So, so Neil Young gets all coked up, right? Yeah. And he charges on stage and uh, helpless. Like a nine-minute version of Helpless, and these right. people are like falling asleep in their mashed potatoes. They've got to be, and he's like, "Okay, we'll fire him up with my second song, wait, which wait, is first, Four <laughs> Strong <laughs> Winds." Where the hold hell was? A wait a second. That per you forgot to mention that like it's this beautiful version of Helpless with like Joni Mitchell off stage, warbling in the background. I'm like, oh. like. There's like yeah, I can see background. I can see you know like yeah. cocaine blowing through the the auditorium during that entire thing all 12 minutes of it. I just it's not <laughs> exciting. I don't, I don't agree with your assessment of helpless. I kind of feel like it was an amazing moment. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, 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 so they're scrambling now. And okay, Brian, I thought you were going to set it up with like how he is chopped up different. The actual show went down, which um, when I went out to like watch it today, couldn't find it on any streaming services. And I found like a super eight movie of the entire left show. Left on these streaming services? I couldn't find it. And then, and then there, but there is on YouTube, there is on YouTube, the full show shot from a single camera from, you know, over at the picnic <laughs> in, in its original order, um, which was, you know, changed my mind. Cause I thought much followed Van Morrison, which he does in the movie. Right. And mm. also tried to like, you know, pick up on, on Van's energy. But in fact, Muddy played like third. Do you know all this, Brian? I, I don't know why you haven't schooled me in this. This was all a bit of a revelation. I, to me. I, I, I guess I didn't know uh, the, I, I wasn't, I have not seen the full show. Yeah, yeah and, and it's, I and it's all I've different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's like, it, yeah, I think it's from the Graham, uh, the Bill Graham uh, but archives. It, it is like six hours, right? Or like, oh, nah. I mean, yeah, I don't think so. But yeah, I might I might have fast forwarded it some stuff. Maybe maybe with an intermission it would be six hours. But um you know yeah. I encounter yeah, problem here. Yeah. Like like you know, like when I talk to Wyman, he's like, Oh, the cinematography on blah blah blah. And Nick Tremulus will go on about this too. Nick Tremulus is like the original mix is so fantastic, the movie mix, because as the camera pans to the different instruments. It was they, like a surround sound, a stereo. It, it, the, those instruments come forward, and he thought that was really amazing. And then they they flattened that all out in the remix, and, and he was in the two thousand out about that. Yeah. And, and 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 Wyman will go on a rhapsodic journey talking about I can't remember what song, but where they show each member of the band playing and and loves the cinematography. Which, like I said, I'm not the biggest film buff <laughs> to, to care about that, you know. So so so. so what I want to say too is that you know when it came to back to the theaters, I took my w very enthusiastic wife. She's like, "Yeah, man, we're gonna go see that." We went down to Old Town and and went to the theater, the theater yeah. and we're like, "This okay, we're gonna see it in the theater, and then it'll come to life." And man. then, then all of a sudden, you know, the cranberry sauce kicks in, and then Neil <laughs> Diamond comes on stage, and then okay, the Neil Diamond. Aaron, oh, I will Aaron, give you that. Clapped, Brian, here, here's As a, a fan of the last ball, so we're going to concede Neil Diamond. We're not. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean that's, 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 that's yeah. yeah, low-hanging fruit. I, but, I but, 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 tell me. It, it was magical. I think it was actually in my Facebook memories today. Uh, <laughs> tell me the second song clapped in place. And maybe it didn't make uh, the cut in the movie. Hmm. But um, so I saw it at the music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Angel, let's the go up on and then, and then and Neil yeah, Diamond and everyone was just like, "What the?" <laughs> it, it, it's a weird thing that Robbie Robertson does throughout that. I don't know how many times he does. He goes, "You know, here's someone you know for sure." He does that for Neil Diamond, which is like, uh, and everyone's like, "Yeah, we do." What's he doing here? Which is hilarious. It's, it's but he does, he does. He does the it's same Neil thing. Doing an awful song. It's like not Neil Diamond coming out and doing like, you know, his hits, which yeah. you which you now could look back on and say, yeah, no, like his great '60s stuff is back on a par with their great '60s stuff too. But, right. Yeah, but that's he a good does point. some like contemporary Neil something on the album he was working on with Robbie. And it's, Dry your eyes. It's, it's yeah, that one. So just, oh. Awful. So to answer your question, uh, so the second song that Clapton did, you're asking? Yeah. Further, I can see it. further on off the road. Oh, no, I'm talking about, yes, the one before that. The oh, legendary, legendary the, the classic, the unforgettable, All, all Our past. past Times. What the hell yeah. is that? Is that even a Clapton song? What? Where did that come from? And it's really bad. Well, I don't know if it made the movie. Clapton at that era is already pretty bad to begin with, you know. And of course, we've talked about him <laughs> yeah, before. We, and we've, we've we've thought about doing an episode on when when do we cancel Eric Clapton? Like, what when do we stop? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when, I, know. I know. And again, I'm going to say I don't like anything like a, he ever did myself. Really? Nothing. Not even. I yeah, I mean, I, I, there's a there's a handful of Clapton songs that I still really love, you know. So I'm I'm not a complete hater, but. 
I kind of hate uh, Steely Dan, but I like Ricky Don't Lose That Number. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a whole nother rabbit hole we'll go down. But you know, yeah, the, I used the, to... the, the, the lyrical in, intensity of what Steely Dan sang about so many times is, you know, like, like, like Charlie Freak is a song that I came to life that's just beyond belief how harrowing and it's it's fantastic but you know the, the music is all catchy the words are amazing i need to listen to that one because i mean Charlie I like, freak uh, you know I, like come back. I don't know that one at me if, if you don't love it it's unbelievable and it's also I got a holiday you. theme to it yeah that's it yeah i remember you talking about that the holiday theme to the song yeah the one thing it's missing in in the uh, the last waltz in the movie, of course, and if I guess if you watch the the uh, four hour four hour twenty minute version, uh, there's all these uh, po uh, poets that come up. Yeah, Emma Corrigan, like a lot of the San Francisco cast. Yeah, which that's also that, kind of, that was yeah. in what I watched today. That was cool. Yeah, and but, the, yeah, uh, I mean, dangerous again to have the tryptophan crowd you know, I feel like, the poetry. Lawrence like Bernard Getty that I've gotten the last faults is enough. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm excited to watch the four, the full show. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm not looking, I, I'm a little nervous. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of averse to poetry anyway. I'm just gotta, I don't know what it is. One of the hell's uh, angels. You're, you must be a moron because poetry is just fucking awesome. You know? And I teach, and I have a writing teacher. So it's, it's, it's a, it's been an issue. Why, why do I struggle with poetry? Well, know. you know, it might be the poetry that you're reading, you know, because not all of it is good, you know. And yeah, you I think there's a lot of poetry. So much, it's usually terrible, you know. Did I read somewhere where Jewel it was the greatest selling poet of of the last half of the 20th century? No, I, again, I don't know. Again. But when I was young, I I, I decided the I was most... going to be a poet when I was about two years old, and I did nothing but focus on poetry my whole life. And then when I was 13, I realized nobody gives a fuck about poetry. And that's when I decided to uh, become a rock musician. So I set my poems to music and then people went but stare at the album cover and read it yeah. over and over. And so did that's you, what I did. That was my very practical decision. Uh, in, in your shift. journey through life, Kathy, did you ever do poetry readings? I did. I used to do them with Daniel Johnson. He and I would go to poetry readings and he would read his poetry and I would read David Thornberry's, uh, which I was a big fan of. And uh, and at that point, I had no I no longer was writing pure poetry, just words on a page. I was if I ever wrote anything good, I would set it to music You know, at that point, you know. Right. But uh, but uh, but I but I do like poetry. And, you know, nowadays there are some really good people doing it. But for a long time, it was really bad. It was like, you know, forget about it. It was terrible. But uh but I think as an art form, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's probably the king of the literary art forms when you do it well, you know. And uh, like, one time when I was on acid, I read a bunch of poetry to my band to try and make them see that poetry was cool, and they were all converted because you know they wow. were on acid and they were their minds were open, you know. Yeah, I think right. that Jim Morrison who points out that like, um, you know, poetry is kind of one of the only art forms that you can, you can, you can re reproduce, uh, you know, like. Um, you can memorize it as opposed to That's like it's really to memorize you know a, a song or a novel or you know well people can memorize a song pretty easy yeah although though it's very very sad if you're mostly coming from a lyrical place which i usually am to realize how much people can not even know the words to their favorite song for a lot of people the words just don't matter but one thing i noticed as a as a rock musician who's writing songs is that even the people in the band who don't listen to the words they would still know which ones had the best words and like those ones best uh yeah, just yeah, with, you know, with some kind of sense you know i don't listen to the words when i'm playing but i am i'm always looking for like a, there's always a word where i'm like i know i need to be here when i hear this word like so i, I yeah. i'll like i'll talk i'm back just and saying like, oh, i'm just saying you say you know? if you are looking for poetry and music do not pull out your moby grape first record that no, is where poetry goes to die there's not i don't it's it's gibberish it's not even it's an insult to the word poet but i'm not a, I'm not a big fan so i'm on the same page as you you know, so, <laughs> you, know you, you you get you get you get kudo but you know uh you know you know who's really a good poet I, is frank I wanna, black. Can I just share this? frank black uh, from the pixies is really good poet he's really good okay yeah, yeah. and if you if you listen to pixie songs they're like lyrically phenomenal and then, and he's really good. So there, there, there's some people out there doing it that you know, it's worth listening. I to. Quickly I, I interrupt you yet again. Okay, Brian. So 
I, I was uh, asking Rita to help me identify a record. You know, I just I got a score from like the Chirp Record Fair. And so I pulled something out and uh, she's, I said, what is this record? And she said, um, it's a, a Nobody Good. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think I bought anything called by a group called Nobody Good. And she's like, well, hold on, let me get my glasses. And she pulls out her glasses and she goes, oh, it's um, M-O-B-Y, Moby Great. <laughs> she and got was, it right the first time. She I got it right the like first time. Pat Daly, somewhere Pat Daly is smiling. <laughs> What other uh, sacred cows do you do you hate, Pat? That people get like. Uh, I guess we could, nah. we, could, we could do a round round on that one. I no, guess. no, I don't. I don't keep a like an inventory of them at hand. But you know, they'll come up, and I'll be like, "Oh, come on, you're yeah, kidding like, me, right?" But like I, I can't, knew for the last waltz, we had to get him. And it, and it was funny because when Angel and I were talking about the la doing a last waltz thing, I was like, "Well, I'd like to get." You know some of the anti last waltz perspective out there and yeah he literally texted me back and said i i wasn't aware that there was any anti last waltz perspective i mean well there there is a i, I know tom sharpling hates the band and he loves the rag have you ever hit you ever check him out no no the, the best uh great or the best show ever um tom sharpling but he has a burning hatred for uh for the band just considers them totally uh like humorless i think that's the hey thing. wait a minute this, what do you mean the best show ever this is the best show ever <laughs> thank, you, thank you well thank you thank you um but yeah uh so yeah i i, I know there's like some derision but in general like like it's funny that uh um, so you went to see the movie at uh piper piper's alley right right, right. yeah because my exactly. uh, so so next week uh just an announcement we're going to be on wednesday instead of thursday because of thanksgiving of course so we're going to have a special show uh we're going to talk to, uh, some mad love about the the last waltz so but yeah. <laughs> so the two people that are going to be on the show my friends colby Stark. I, am, I think i might be busy that night but yeah i'll, I'll put it in my <laughs> that's, that's what I was no thinking. promises i mean you're, hey you're i want to tell you my last waltz story it's super yes. boring Okay, when, when the last waltz came out, I had never you, heard of them. Before. That's okay. Pat thinks the whole thing's super boring. So, <laughs> well, I'd, I'd never heard of them because I was a teenager in Texas and I'd never heard of them. So, it was a big deal. Like all of a sudden, the last waltz was coming to theaters and people were going, and I was like, "Well, I guess I better check it out," you know. And so, I went to go see it, and I, this is what I thought: Oh, I like some of these songs, I guess. So they're breaking up or something? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of you yeah, know, um, yeah. I liked when Tony Mitchell came on and Ben Morrison was good, but uh, overall, I thought I have to give it a, you know, I don't really highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's the, the what the kids. There's a word M E H that the kids use. I don't know how to pronounce yeah. it. That's not yeah. really a. That's an old. That's an old Jewish term. <laughs> Meh. You know, uh, but I, but I, I didn't realize that some of those songs that were by the band were by them. And so right. when I heard. Them, like oh yeah, they I wrote know, some greats there's no doubt uh, cripple creek i know this song and, uh, so and I know this song, you know. yeah kathy do you now have older siblings then i i do but like i mentioned my uh relationship with my brother was not really great which although was fraught yeah so so but, my, he, but, I have he, older... but, he, but he did he did do several really great things for me one of which was the only people that he admired whatsoever were rock musicians and i'm sure that it influenced me in, in my choice of career that I wanted my older brother to like, you know, respect me. Yes. You know? And then I became a, yeah. a big rock star and like, you know, and then when I perform, I sometimes uh, channel, channel him and act like him and stuff because uh, he was really into it, you know. That's uh, cool. I, I, well, a lot of my really good uh, moves are, are me imitating him, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I have to, my husband just texted me that like uh, he left something in the toaster oven and I'm going to go check on it. So. Oh, yeah, please. Well, I was going to say, I got older siblings, and that's, so I knew about the band. I was going to say that um, my brother Tim saw <laughs> Dylan in the band at Chicago Stadium. Oh, yeah. You know, like, you know, before the flood era. And the, the enduring memory of that is that being, I was at my, you know, maybe my grandparents' house. I get these stories kind of conflicting. One one story was at, at, at um being at my grandparents' house, and um, my brother Timmy's like, uh, I got a split, you know, dinner here. I got concert tickets tonight. And my, my grandfather, Poppy, says, well, who are you going to see? Timmy goes, the Grateful Dead. 
And oh my oh, God, no. my grandfather just laughed and laughed and laughed till he cried. This is what his progeny were up to, going to see the Grateful Dead and <laughs> leaving family dinner to do so. But the, the story that I was really getting at was that my another night similar, um, I'm like, where's Timmy? She's like, he's going to see Bob Dylan? <laughs> I'm like, come on, mom. I think she was putting me on. <laughs> Who doesn't know how to pronounce Dylan? Dylan. So anyway, that's how I knew the band, you know. Anyway, the, the, stuff, in the, toaster little oven, the stuff in the toaster oven is fine. Oh, oh good, good news. Good, good news. Those that are said Hot Pockets or uh, Pop-Tarts? What are we talking? Well, we feed our dog human food because that makes him live longer. Oh. And uh, my husband uh, cooked a whole bunch of meat for him and then he forgot about it. And it looks perfectly cooked oh. and fine. So we'll just give it to him tonight. It'll be fine. Human oh, yeah. If you, if, you feed, if you feed your cat or dog a regular food that has, you know, like regular human grade food, yeah, they'll live like twice as long in case you have oh, a pet. I did not know that. I mean, they can sometimes, cats can sometimes live to be 30 years old if you feed them actual food. Uh, so mm. you put that in your pipe and smoke it, you know. So I, that's what I do. I feed my chicken a rotisserie chicken. I feed my dog rotisserie chicken and steak. <laughs> like that I'm going to feed your chicken. That, that can't be right. It's not that expensive dog food. Dog food costs a fortune. They're charging a million dollars for industrial waste when you oh. buy dog food and cat food. So just you know, <clears> make them regular <throat> food and give, it, give, them your, give them your food and uh, they're happy. Live longer. Oh, my, my dog, my dog should be dead by now, and uh, he's still youthful, you know, because he gets no, real, I, real. I food. did not know that this show featured public service announcements. But, I yeah, mean, there's well, you know, so much well, happening here. Well, we're we're uh, very disjointed. I don't know if you've read the reviews, but we are disjointed. Yeah, this is our last Judy still. Uh, yeah, we were disjointed are, and disappointing. Disjointed. You know, disjointed. and too much male waffling. <laughs> the, the name of the thing is fun in a you know Bill and Ted's excellent adventure way, but disjointed but, has a lot of zing to it as a name of for this show. Just I well, like it I, because but also I think these guys are totally like smoking the dube. Aren't you guys smoking the dube? Oh, we've there? been smoking yeah, the dube, we're definitely drinking. Not yeah, disjointed. I mean, we're no, no, yeah. we're perfectly well. It's There's, you know, it's been disjointed in that sense, right? I, I want you to know that I covered, a, I covered a, the song a "California Thing" by Freddie Johnston. If you don't know okay. that that number uh, on my new record, Apotheosis. And that song is entirely about smoking the dube, and it's a great, it's, it's a hit, man. It's, I can't believe it wasn't a bigger hit when he put it out, but my number, my my cover of it is going to be a huge hit. So, uh, you know, just get guys, ready. You got your label mates, right? We were, and that's how I knew about the song. And, like, I was out in L.A., and I thought, I want to listen to a song about L.A. And I thought, well, when I I did a show once with Freedy, and uh, he said, will you sing the backup vocal on, on the song? And I said, sure. And he said, it's a California thing. And I said, uh, fill me in. I, I haven't listened to your record, really. And he did. And he said, well, I go la, 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 la. But what I'm saying is L.A. The song's about L.A. And so when I was out in L.A., I thought, well, I'll listen to that song while I'm here. And so I put it on the thing. And I went, oh, man, I need to cover the song because I sing it better than him. And so uh, so I covered it. And it's a super big hit. I mean, I covered it. I covered it so great. I, w I wish I could uh, send oh, yeah. it to all of you on the email because uh, it's really good. And uh, yeah, no anyway, one. it's all about smoking the dube. And like when I was listening to it, I uh, did not realize that. I thought it was about L.A. And uh, and I covered it thinking about how much I like being in L.A. and how much fun I have when I'm there. And then uh, I was playing it for John D. Graham, my cover. And he said, you know, you know, the song's about smoking the dube, right? And I went, no. And he went, yeah, he's going like this. Hi. Hi. He's thinking about how high he is. And I went, oh. <laughs> i didn't realize it but uh yeah anyway i'm singing it you know and i'm going ha i thought it was just a sound like right. D -D -D. Yeah. i didn't realize he was talking about how high he was and so i have this uh song all about smoking the dube on my new record and like uh and Maybe also, I, w I want you to know my producer brian Beatty smokes the dube 24 hours a day and so i uh I think that's kind of cool that like I have a song about smoking the dube. I mean, I'm not against it. I, my, I myself personally don't do it that much because uh, uh, it, it doesn't agree with me personally. Yeah. And I tell people that and they're like, does it make you paranoid? And I'm like, no, the, my problem is that uh, what I do 24 hours a day is think. I think and mentalize. I think about stuff all the time. All I'm doing is thinking 24 hours a day. And, uh, and when I smoke the dube, I can't think. My thinking yeah, thinks. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I hate it. I hate it. And I... 
grasp my head between my hands and I go, why do you people do this to yourselves? It, and it's so funny because that's exactly why I do it. Like, I, I also like think like all, all like I can't, I can't stop overthinking things and, and it like mm-hmm. gives me the ability to like folk, stop thinking about, you know, all these other things enough to get, yeah. uh, you know, I, I cannot stand fun. not having the constant stream of thoughts. I mean, like, I think it's incredibly amusing and keeps me interested in things, you know, but I do, like I said, tend to guess on, you know, so it's kind of like, uh, yeah. No, uh, you, all I'm doing is sharing what's already going on in my head with other people yeah. because it never stops. But, you know, I like it. But, you know, well, and that's what not. I guess. I guess if anything, like for us smoking, I mean, I, I smoke a ton of weed as well, but we're also productive and we're doing this show. And the yeah, fact that we, we have I, this platform. It, it's and, really, and really great for people like record producers, because what I sometimes I go to the studio and everyone in the, in the studio is getting high and they're uh they're like a you know mouth in the bong and everything and i'm i feel left out and so i'm kind of like <laughs> yeah. well i guess i'll smoke a little dude with you i guess maybe you know and so i'll, I'll get high and when and I'm, I'm high in the I'm, studio i'm like this i can hear I was, everything so much more separated i can hear yeah. every percussion every bass note i can hear it differently and so i understand why musicians love it because you can hear music differently and you can hear it in a much like more focused way. Yeah. So I think I so I think that smoking the dude is great for being a I think producer. For me, like depression. It's great for being a musician and it's kind of great for being a music appreciator. I mean all those things yeah. is really good. One yeah, time I, just, I Yeah, I mean I'm I was sorry. on like 300 milligrams of uh Effexor and then you know once I started using uh marijuana you know have been able to like get down to like half that dose which you know hope my hope is eventually to get off of off of it completely just because yeah. i just i worry about what it does <laughs> long term and you know uh well you know marijuana is very very beneficial for your health and not only that if you get covid it's going to help you it's really yeah, really effective yeah. against covid so like you know it's good it's, it's good for a lot of things and it's also good for pain management you know if you have a lot of yeah, people. absolutely, yeah. And well, it's great. It's, so sad it's great you when you're a like, producer. It's great when you're a musician. It's great for a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's not great for Kathy McCarty because it makes my mental stream. Of yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's one of those things. If it doesn't it. work for for someone, it's not you know. The yeah. drug I really like is morphine, but you know you can't get it. <clears throat> well, you have to get you have to get like surgery to get. You have to like what I you, know. The you, only I had oral surgery had last year. And I remember waking up from oral surgery and thinking, you know, it's really a shame, like that I have to go through this to feel like this. Like, I know. <laughs> like, why can't I, I just give the person forty dollars and be like, hey, can I lay in that chair and get that feeling again? Yeah. yeah. Before and after major surgery, you get morphine, and you're kind of like, this is the best drug ever. Oh my god, you know, you never can get it again. You know, so sad, so sad. Ah. <sighs> Anyway, yeah. uh, so speaking of drugs, the last waltz. <laughs> so, <laughs> so speaking so of drugs, the last waltz. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm kind of with Pat on some things. I mean, I'm. Here's the thing. Where's I'm, Pat? I'm, Did he go away? I don't see his face. Oh, he's anymore. there. Come okay. here. Okay. So there he is. Obviously, I have a reverie for that movie. <laughs> However, I think it was at a time when I used to drink, and I know mm-hmm. this was because I have a actually. Uh, the guy that's going to be coming in next week, my good friend Matt. I'm Oshie. drinking right now. There you go. <laughs> Salud. But uh, back when I used to drink and get really debauch, uh, yeah, he would have this uh, uh, Thanksgiving uh, dinner and then followed by the last waltz. And, you know, we have a great time. And But, how you know, like I said, it was during the time when I used to drink. So, yeah, I'm going to have to watch it now. So you've and, not watched it? As a sober person, sober. so. Actually, the phrase. Hey, I didn't. I, I didn't see the actual movie. So, but yeah, as I was watching it, life is a carnival. Um, you know, it's a fun, bubbly, you know, upbeat song. Just feel it for the glacial tempo. The total <laughs> lack of carnival. <laughs> it's, 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 it's DOA. And 
<laughs> you know who's come really at, good as I say, kind of come song? at me if you think different. You know who's really good at that kind of song? The monkeys. Oh yeah. The monkeys do oh, not I... get enough respect, man. The monkeys oh, man. Really oh. have some great numbers. Someone was going on about Take a Giant Step this morning. That, that's the record I listened to with my coffee this morning was uh, The Monkees. The Monkees are really good, but I, I want you to know this. I met Mickey Dolenz when I was in L.A. Uh, not, not the, the, the time before last I went to L.A., I got to meet Mickey Dolenz. And I want wow. you to know this. He's the world's hugest asshole. Oh, he is, wow. He is such an asshole. That's a and bummer. It was, and, it was, and it was a bummer for me because I was really looking forward to meeting him. Like, oh, my God, Mickey Dolan. Oh, oh my God, I love the monkeys, you know. And uh, I, I really respect them as an artist, which a lot of, they don't get a lot of that, right? You know, they get a lot right. of dismissive yeah. stuff like the prefab four and stuff. But like they had a lot of really good songs and they had good musicians and they, you know, they were not a shitty band or anything. And yeah, so no. I was looking forward to meeting him and like uh, the guy is like really, really on a like negative star trip, you know, really bad. And because he's a professional, him. when I when I met him, I snapped a picture of him and he smiled for it, you know. So I got a picture of Oh, here's Mickey Dolan smiling and stuff. But the, the show I was doing was with John Sebastian. Yeah, I wanted to act. Oh, wow. I, I, yeah, okay. and, like John, like, and like John Sebastian to was so nice. He was so cool. He like everybody else on the bill. He'd like meet them and say like, you know, hi, I like, you know, thanks for doing the show. And I'm so happy to be playing with you. And he was like Mr. Like wonderful guy. And then yeah. Mickey Dolan was really super mad because he, before John Sebastian came on the bill, he was the biggest star. And so he thought he, he was going to be the biggest star in the bill. Whoa. And then John Sebastian said he would do the bill too. Cause it was like a, a it was a tribute show to, uh, you know, uh, the Love and Spoon. Right. Yeah. And so uh, the only reason I was on it was because um, I signed up really early. Like, yeah, I want to be part of this uh, tribute to the Love and Spoon Phil. And so even though I'm not very famous, I, you know, I was already signed up. And then way later, John Sebastian signed up and it became this huge deal. And uh, before that, though, Mickey Dolenz was the biggest star or, you know, like has been whatever. I, I always say to my friends, like big, st big show of has been that was happening. And uh, anyway, he was such an unbelievable dick you know, I mean, to everybody. I mean, my God, it was really depressing. And this might be a, a topic for a future show is that. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it I'll possible stop, stop that he. No, 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 no. I, I think I'm just piecing it all together now. Did he, in fact, murder the other monkeys? Is it just. No, I, I don't uh, think I, so. No, I don't think so. Well, I was going to. So, but, but, but I think that I think that he really, you know, he really has like a like big ego about it, you know, and like, hey, man, that was like. Yeah. 50 fucking years ago. What I mean, you know who else was there was uh, the guy from the Partridge family, Danny oh, David uh, Cassidy or oh, Danny Bonaducci. Danny Bonaducci was there. Oh, and wow. he was doing us he was doing a song and I did a song. And I have to mention at this point that the only two people that Variety magazine mentioned were John Sebastian and Kathy McCarty because I fucking mm, killed nice. that show. Awesome. I killed. I, I went out there and I fucking yeah, cool. the audience with a So sword. did you do a love and spoonful? Yeah song I, is that the i did and you know i i i i was asked like what song which i could do and i picked like seven in a row and they were all taken by people bigger than me and so i said to the promoter i said you know my range you know what pick i can one. do yeah pick one for me, right and so he picked this one and he said it to me it's the biggest piece of shit song ever <laughs> it was a song called younger generation and it was like a piece it's of shit song. Song. <laughs> it was like the it was like the most fucking suck song ever like the guy tossed it off half away <laughs> they gave they, so they gave that so that song to the great kathy mccarty I mean, yeah. that's how right and so i said i gotta sell this with my star power right so i gotta yeah. sell yeah. it so i learned i went to somebody i know who's a really incredible awesome guitar singer i said teach me how to play the accompaniment because i can't do it is, I need to do it good and so he, he taught me how to do it and then I like practice it and practice it and practice it and I played it for my like fucking neighbors and people like my, my mom and stuff but then my mom w wasn't alive but I mean people like my mom you know like regular yeah. people nor <laughs> normies right so I started yeah. playing it for like, normies and stuff to see if I could get this like piece of shit song cross with my star power and my interpretation right and they would like weep and I went okay I nailed it okay I'm gonna do it <laughs> And so I got to this like show 
and there's like 83 other performers and all of them are like who the fuck are you and i'm like no i'm from austin i'm just a person you know and, hi you know and hey, so um... i get out there and i and i'm ready to do the song and i go on the stage and i and like john d graham texts me goes how you doing and i said i'm about to go out and he said tell them i only have 20 minutes to make you love me and i said well i only got two minutes the song's two minutes long and he said well say that it's even funnier and so i went out and i said hi i'm kathy mccarty i got two minutes to make you love me and i launched into this song and i did it there i am yeah and uh i'm 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 weeping I'm already and it, and it had the part where you said i got two and a half minutes to make you love me that's, yeah, that's in the so video. I totally killed. And then when I went backstage, all these people who'd been ignoring me and treating me like nothing were like, who the fuck are you? you you're like, little... I'm Mickey Dolan's bitch. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> anyway, I, I wish I could say Mickey Dolan's was nice to me after that, but he wasn't. I didn't even see him again, but I did see him like one second before I went on and I was kind of like, hi, I'm Kevin McCarty. And I burst into his hotel room to take a picture of him and he smiled because of, he's a professional. Like he smiled when he was getting he's his picture Hollywood, taken. Yeah. So I have a picture right. of Mickey Dolan's in his backstage room, smiling at me. But that's it. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny you just reminded me. This Sunday is uh, where I am actually going to go see Mickey Dolan's with my girlfriend. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good. Well, you know, Peter. So at the he may, he may have changed <laughs> as he's yeah, gotten yeah, older actually, in these I, past eight months. Maybe he's was, maybe he's mellowed. So I was going to show off my monkey's tattoo. I don't know if you can see it there, but it's... Oh, okay. I worship you now that you have a monkey's tattoo. Because <laughs> yeah. Everybody in Glass Eye, a bunch of musical snobs of the first degree, I must say. I mean, everyone in Glass Eye was a musical snob of the first degree. We sure. all love the monkeys. We all love the monkeys. And if you have a monkey... You were in Glass that Eye? Makes you cool. Yeah, I was in Glass Eye. Yeah. I am the girl singer of Glass Eye. I'll be damned. That's a good band for sure. Uh, we, we we were very good. We were a very good band. We never got any fucking money. Or, Did you, you know, play questions. Chicago? Did I see you back we in the day? Oh, we yeah. played Chicago hundreds, I mean, not hundreds of times, but like, yeah. we probably played Chicago like at least, uh, I don't know, 15 times. Maybe. Yeah, I'm sure I saw you back in the day. I, I didn't make the connection. That's wild. Well, you know, uh, we were the, one of those bands that was like this. All the record labels like this. How can you describe it? And people would go, I don't know. But you know what? The other day, I thought of how to describe us. Finally. Finally, I thought of how to describe us. This is Glass Eye. We are like a cross between Richard and Linda, Linda Thompson and the Butthole Surfers with a little <laughs> war thrown in. A little war? Oh, God. Because oh, wow. war was What's not to love? Show. That's the, that's the magic power. ingredients right there. Right down. there. So, war. Myself, There's a war yeah. never gets nearly enough love. Oh, uh, we Actually, always did Low Rider. I mean, like, we love that song. Mm, we love mm. so many war songs, we, mm. you know. And also, I guess because I grew up in the 70s, I can, the only thing I have an actual talent for on the guitar is playing disco guitar. I, got, I have some really, like, fucking badass disco guitar moves. Uh -huh. And so war stuff really worked for us. Disco's you know? way underrated. Now I'm thinking though, here's where here's here's where we're gonna wrap. Gotta go drink beer and smoke cigarettes. So I'm getting like but shouldn't you know, there be a version of the last waltz? Shouldn't there be a version of the last waltz where instead of the band, it's war? Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, like an alternate last waltz. Don't you love that war song about? I think the war the dudes are all still alive. They could do it like Thursday if we if we mm -hmm. pull yeah. our stuff yeah. together here quickly. <laughs> Might I interject that I failed to mention it, but I'm also going to make be making a disco record as a side project too, because I, I I looked at my list of song ideas that I had of the songs I wanted to write, and I realized that like half of them were me bragging, bragging about being me. <laughs> and so I thought, well, that really lends itself to disco music. So uh, yeah. that's what disco music is. It's like, hey, look at my beautiful ass and stuff. And so I was like, well, okay, I'm going to write a bunch of disco songs. So The time is ripe for a, like disco. a really kick-ass disco record. Yeah, uh, I'm going to make one too. All out. I'm, I'm already working on it. And the way I did it was this. I can't play bass. I can't play drums. I, I need to get somebody else to write that shit for me. And then I'll put yeah. a disco, disco guitar on top because I'm really good at that. 
And like, I found a bunch of people willing to do that for me. And so like, all I got to do is write the disco guitar and then write my bragging songs about how fucking awesome I am. And so um, this is this is this is Brian and do a show what we call a scoop. Yeah, yeah. Right. It is, it is a I don't think anyone knows about it except us. So, a lot of exclusive. So yeah, once this goes out, I mean, Hi, honey. Gonna... I pulled the uh, stuff out of the toaster oven sitting on the counter. I'm doing my podcast. Now. I told him I'm doing my All right, you stoners. I got to jump. All right. Pat, I this? Have to eat you, Pat. Mr. Pat the likewise. Likewise, my fellow Irish. I'm Irish as well. Lassie. So connection with you. Yeah. <laughs> likewise. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Feel my Thanks connection. Thanks for trashing the trash in the of grave. all the money the hair i've spent don't start singing the old songs oh, all right i gotta jump love you guys you're awesome right. the show is so out. disjointed it's so disjointed and, and disappointing <laughs> no not just i can't believe he's not gonna listen to me sing the parting glass i mean that's a really great irish song you know there he goes. Some people. Yeah, he's... You know, I told a bunch of people after I made a Dead Dog's Eyeball that my next record was going to be all Irish traditional songs. And like, I never did it because I had no money. But believe me, I could make an incredible record of uh, Irish traditional songs because that's what I grew up listening to. I heard nothing but Irish traditional music until I was like about 12. I mean, like, when I heard Simon and Garfunkel, I thought it sounded like death metal. Compared to what I'd been listening to, because because all I had ever heard in my life was like the fucking Clancy Brothers, you know, and uh, yeah. you know other people like that. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, I have actually a love for Irish. Uh, my oh, ex-wife. yeah, I love Irish music. Uh, oh. I wish I was in Carrick Fergus, only for nights in Ballygrand. Yeah, I know them all. <laughs> That's, That's great. So can I ask you in Austin? Um Angel Andrew got to ask a butthole surface question. So I, I, sure. I think I I wanna ask, do you have any Rocky Erickson uh stories? You, to, you know, I really don't. He was older than me, and so I never yeah. really knew him that well. And a lot of people I know played with him, backed him up, and people who are side players. But I was never part of that group because I'm not that good on my instrument so i would, never was a side player for anyone and mm-hmm. so and so, but but at the same time he was a very respected here and a lot of people that are close friends of mine backed him up when he played mm-hmm. you know like kind of like daniel you know and uh and so i'm super fond of him and i recognize his genius excuse me his genius i mean like two-headed dog I mean, come on! That's an incredible song. Yeah, yeah, so good. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, he's he's a real he's a real he's a real songwriter. He's a, and and uh, and yeah, like like Daniel, he was like totally insane, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think that my husband and a lot of people would say like Kathy's like That's half insane, but she's not totally insane, you know. So. Uh, uh, but, you know, Daniel and Rocky were both like, you know, like seriously in and out of the mental hospital and scene, you know. So, yeah. so anyway, yeah. he was a great guy and, uh, and he wrote some great tunes, you know. But, you know, Towns Van Sant wrote a lot of great tunes, too. I mean, there's a lot of great yeah. songwriters from here, you know, of which I am one, despite my gender, which seems to be a huge problem for a lot of people. It's um, but, crazy yeah. too. I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> I guess I think by the I mean, time when you're we... a woman, you got to be ten times as good for one tenth the appreciation. I mean, if any man had written the songs that I've written, sure, they would be nationally respected. And you know, yeah, it fucking sucks. But you know, I've got to live in the, the paradigm I'm in, I'm in you know, so we're. I mean, yeah. when I first met, when I when I when Glass Eye was on their first tour, we uh, a bunch of shows uh, fell out, as happens for bands that uh, mm-hmm. aren't very famous, right? And so we had we had a bunch of gigs. Uh, we had a gig with uh, the Butthole Surfers in Athens, Georgia, where they were living at the time, mm. because they had they had moved to Athens because they thought they might get more famous from there. I mean, that was a, you know we're talking about like I don't know eighty four, eighty five, really early. 
And so we had a gig with them in Athens, and we did it. And like, and then, uh, and then, and Gibby was so good. I mean, he had a close business hair, thrown his head around. He was, he was, they were great. And then we were like, oh well, our next six shows uh, fell through. Can we keep staying at your house for six days? And they were like, sure. And <laughs> they were such sweethearts. And so we were staying with them. And and Paul Leary came over to me, the guy that I that I socked, you know, the guy I socked. Right, right. And he said, uh, you know, I've been listening to all your songs and. Uh, you're really great. And like, he knew all my lyrics. I can't tell you how much that touched my heart. Like you listen to my fucking lyrics and you memorize them. Okay. I really like you now, even though I socked you, you know, I'm sorry, you know, yeah, sorry I punched you there. <laughs> there knocked some sense into him, I guess. <laughs> and then I had, he had a book sitting in his house, all about Oppenheimer and the atomic bomb. And I was reading it because I'm a big reader. And when mm. I was telling you, I said, uh, you know, I need to give you this book back. And he said, oh, just take it with you. You know, it's fine. And I wrote my incredible hit Invention, which is about the atomic bomb, uh, you know, because of that of that book that I read at their house while we were staying with them. And uh, anyway, what was the point of my story? I kind of forget now. Uh, anyway, they were really super cool. And, you know, Paul Leary, like, you know, super respected my songwriting, which I very much appreciated because, you know, I'm a girl. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, but at the same time, it's, I guess my point was kind of like, you know, if, if if I was a dude with a wiener, I mean, everybody would respect my songwriting. But because I'm a girl, I mean, everybody just thinks, oh, you're an interpreter of boys. And like, yeah. I knew when I made the Doug's Eyeball that people would think I was his Joan Baez, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I was willing to take that hit because I thought at the time, no one outside of the city, city limits of Austin had ever heard of him. And right. I didn't want music to be lost forever. And so I thought, I will take that hit and, and I'll overcome it with my own songwriting. And yet here I am, you know, what I'm known for is interpreting his shit, you know. So, yeah. I mean, on one level, that's that's fine. I took that risk. I, I played that gamble. And, uh, you know, and I would do it again because... The man's music need to be heard. It need to be heard. Yeah. But uh, maybe, maybe with my next record, maybe people will start to realize, hey, you know, Daniel Johnson thought you were the John Lennon of Austin. Maybe other people realize that you actually have talent in spite of the fact you don't have a fucking wiener, you know? Exactly. We definitely have a bigger wiener than John Lennon, that's for damn sure, so... Well, you know, it, it really is a sexist, sexist business, but it's a, it's a sexist world, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and, and of then, course, you know, yeah, yeah. what do I have left? Maybe five years before I croak, you know. So like, you know, I did my best. You know, I did my best, and maybe, maybe people care about me someday. You know. Well, I mean, our, we care about you. Yeah, we we definitely care about you, Kathy. Well, and, you know, uh, I'm very very touched that you uh, appreciate the genius of another day in the sun because the fucking great record. You know, it's yeah. really fucking lays it out there like. I am a contender, but uh, yeah. no, you got the skills. So, and I do I'm definitely excited for the next record. And I'm, uh, just I excited can't wait for it to come you. out because you know what? I think this record's going to make me, in spite of my advanced age, you know, because uh, it's that good. It's so fucking good. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I believe thanks it. Thanks every day where I'm kind of like, thank you for inspiring me universe to write this record that is so fucking good i mean prince is shittier than me i'm (laughs) really good it's so fucking good anyway good night thank you for having me on your podcast no No, thank you so much thank you and and i want i want all my our our audience or whoever's watching well this will be on tomorrow just to check you out and we'll definitely make sure that uh because yeah yeah i hope i hope you do and you know maybe boner killer will connect with the middle-aged women and then i won't have any more financial problems because no i yeah no i think if you start just just do the teeth don't worry about the band just do the (laughs) t-shirt get them into the stores yeah get them into the malls these kids they don't care about the band you know they just they just want to wear it's funny because you know the name boner killer refers to this. Our middle-aged bodies with their middle-aged spread are killing your boners, you know? But at the same time, it has that kind of edge to it. Boner killer. Yeah, I, I think it's... I think it's... 
I think you need I think you need to pat and that frankly at least two of the chairs. at least two of the women in the band are smoking hot so you know it's not like we're killing all the boners you know <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, I can't any think of for my personal uh, figure but you know I got you know songwriting genius on my side so absolutely yeah. Absolutely, I hear it. So I mean, some men care about like the mind, uh, but most of no. them mostly care about like the figure. <laughs> well, anyway, good night, guys. I got well, thank a, you. A, hey. Good night, Kathy. Have a great, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. That was Kathy. Kathy McCurdy, Pat McCurdy. Daly. Pat Daly. Marathon interview. Woo! Uh, thank you. Thank for... you for watching. Um, I think uh, we've got uh, the Thanksgiving Eve, Thanksgiving Day special. Yeah, so uh, I think we're at least we're going to definitely talk about the last vaults. I'm going to try and watch. I would like to watch the movie again and the the um, the actual show, but I've I've watched the movie at least like last year. Yeah. So maybe I'll just watch the show. Yeah. Um, but. I guess it will, so yeah, so next week our, our guests will be uh, two fans, super fans of, of The Last Waltz. Of The Last Waltz. So. And the band. And uh, their names are Colby Stark and Matt Foch. We didn't want to bum out anyone's Thanksgiving, so we thought we'd have Pat come on tonight and uh, just kind of air out all you the, know, <laughs> the nastiness. Like I said, you, you look, you, it, it's funny tonight that we had two moments where, where there's like some kind of kismet in the, in the universe, because like one was uh when you know like you you and i were talking and you were like uh, you know i was like oh we should get some anti last vaults people and you were like oh uh, you know i don't know any last vaults people and then pat just comes on and it's just, <laughs> you know, they're all just and then and then um she was <laughs> that, that, that song the younger generation is such a horrible song that's what <laughs> it seriously is my favorite john sebastian song he does that at uh woodstock <laughs> Yes, uh, he does a beautiful version of it at Woodstock, yeah. and uh, it's on their last. Uh, is it on Everybody Play or, every, or Everything Play? I think it's their last album. Oh, I'm that. not sure, but yeah, it's a. It it <laughs> I uh, her version's great, but uh, I think it's a great. I love that song. So. Yeah, um, I know that I definitely need to <laughs> ask her some more questions. Oh, and about the, that. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the yeah the, the Mickey. Uh, that is crazy. Yeah, Mickey so Dolan's, that's going to create some, you know, you guys are, well, you're going to see. Let's, yeah, so this, okay, so. Maybe guess, you should try and get, use that to get press credentials. Like, we had a show last week. Yeah, uh, we were just, uh, you know, uh, Kathy McCarty was talking smack about you. Do you want to come be on our, our last, our Thanksgiving Day last fall? Do, you think, awesome Kathy McCar- do you think Kathy McCarty is better than you? <laughs> <laughs> do like some uh, stuttering John kind of. Uh, line of questioning get him just to get him on our show i mean you know we don't really want to start beef but you know if we could we got to get the we got to get the likes up we got to get the numbers yeah and actually the subscribing or subscribers yeah where are we at with our uh so so i'm getting a colonoscopy when we get to 150 angel's getting a colonoscopy when we get to 200 right so right now we're at 48 48 so. so we're just Shy to yeah, still two hundred and two, or right? Well, yeah, one one hundred and two to go. So before I have to start thinking about. I mean, come on, guys. There's like 118 views from the last episode, so that's nice. Yeah, yeah. So th- I um I I so yeah, I'm not gonna address any of the the, the haters out there, but yeah, we're, I will. Uh, you know, we appreciate you. Um. Uh, yes, the show is disjointed. So uh, hopefully this show didn't have as much mail waffling. Yeah, uh, I mean we we certainly let let Kathy, you know. Yeah, we we, we definitely she she had the platform and, and she delivered the goods. Space Thank for, you, Kathy. People to great interview. To, yes, for, for women to, to say what they they want to say. So hopefully hopefully yeah. there won't be any. Uh, and it's great because she is. I was gonna say too. She is like the what I always think of uh, Austin women. You know, at least the, uh, the they they always come up, and you know, especially with Slacker, like those ladies, you can't push those ladies around, and like, and I yeah. appreciate that, you know, her, her energy and just like yeah, just yeah. being willing to come on and talk with us. So, so uh, she is the greatest. 
right. We have found, we, I think we've finally been face to face with, with, the, with greatness. So, yes. Um, so we're going to end it off with one of her songs. Um, it's getting late. I know. Thanks for, for whoever's hanging on. Um, we appreciate you every single night. Um, yeah. So next week. The last waltz. The last waltz with Kobe and Matt. Um, oh, like a mother would, like I've always known, somebody should, yeah. Although tomorrow, it don't look that good. But it just goes to show, though people say we're an unlikely couple, I'm seeing double of you. Hope you guys have a good, safe weekend. I don't know. We're just gonna. This is life, and everything's alright. Living, 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 Said, shout out to Ben Wheatman right there. Yeah, um, yeah, so next week will be uh, the last waltz, and we're gonna uh, have, uh, have a little reflection for Judy Sill since next, uh, yeah, since the 23rd. So, yeah, so we're gonna be on a Wednesday instead of Thursday, and we're gonna talk about the band and Judy Sill. See, some, some podcasts. Let us be like, screw it, it's Thanksgiving, you don't get an episode from right. us. So you get your turkey early from us. That's right. Yeah. Um, are you going to any shows this weekend? I'm going to a record show in Hillside. Oh, at the, at the hotel? Hol- 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 the holiday, yeah. So. It's funny, I used to do, uh, I used to work the the record, the one of the booths there, because uh, the record store I worked at, we would we. Uh, oh, fat, yeah, we, fat cat or hip cat. Okay, okay yeah. hip cat would have a, a table and sell oh, our wares. Wow. So yeah, I totally know that one. And of course, the best was the uh, when the FBI would be would would raid the uh, the record fairs because people were selling. That's your, yeah, that's you. Always go to get your bootlegs. The bootleg yeah. sides, your tapes, your VHSs. Live sides. Live sides. We used to have live sides back in the day. So, oh. Here it comes. It's a sinister. Yeah, this is really the brand. <laughs> Disjointed. <laughs> All right. Should we call it a night? Yep. Thanks uh, for watching. Thank you. Good night. Video off and meeting for 